of the of the Hanukkah and Squamish speaking people. And I would like to extend appreciation for the opportunity to attend uh, from this territory. Today, we have presenters and participants from across Canada and elsewhere. The conference organizers and presenters would appreciate it if all conference attendees could take a moment to reflect on the land they reside on. And you're welcome to put your own land acknowledgement in the chat box. Today's symposium is organized by the Canadian Alliance for Regional Risk Factor Surveillance, a CPHA collaborator. CARFS stands for the Canadian Alliance for Regional Risk Factor Surveillance, and we are a network of public health professionals from across Canada, providing a platform for the pan-Canadian health surveillance community. Now, we do have some poll questions available. If everybody uh, could take a moment to answer those just so that we can get to know our audience here a little bit better. Wonderful, and I don't know if we have the results uh, for the poll just yet. Um, Okay, and I would uh, like to introduce our keynote talk. Um, our keynote will be about 70 minutes, followed by 15 minutes for questions. Each rapid fire presentation will be 10 minutes, followed by two minutes for questions. Um, to ask a question, you may either raise a hand on Zoom and we will unmute you, or you may write your question in the chat box and indicate who the question is for. You may also uh, ask the question in French and we will do our best to translate the answer. And it is now my pleasure to introduce our first keynote speakers from the Public Health Agency of Canada and the World Health Organization. Our speakers today are Dr. Mel Gorzaka, sorry, Dr. Mel Gorzaka, Ms. Gurka, and he is a social epidemiologist who leads a multi multidisciplinary team of experts within the Health Equity Policy Division of the Public Health Agency of Canada. Uh, they are a clinical assistant professor within the social and preventive medicine department at the University of Montreal, and they joined FACT in 2009. Oops, sorry, guys, uh, I just had the poll answers uh, popping up on my screen here. And I'll just go through those at the end after the introductions. Uh, and uh, they joined FAC in uh, 2009, and they are currently advancing a collaborative pan-Canadian initiative on measuring and monitoring health and social determinants of health inequalities. Dr. Ms. Kirka's presentation is entitled Surveillance for Health Equity, Equitable Data Practices and Monitoring at Global and National Levels. We also have Dr. Julia Massa, who is a senior epidemiologist in the Health Equity Policy Division of the Public Health Agency of Canada. She received her training in epidemiology from the Université de Montréal. She has conducted epidemiological research on understanding mental health inequalities across the life course with a focus on children and youth. She joined FAC in 2000, 2018, working primarily on capacity building and knowledge translation initiatives in epidemiology and health promotion. Dr. Maz's presentation is entitled Monitoring Health Inequalities in Canada, an overview of the Pan-Canadian Health Inequalities Data Tool. And we also have Dr. Ahmed Reza Hosenpour, 
who is a medical doctor and an epidemiologist working at the World Health Organization in Geneva, where he leads the work on health inequality monitoring. He has conceptualized and coordinated the development of resources and tools in this area, including the Health Inequality Data Repository, the WHO Global Platform for Disaggregated Health Data, and the WHO Health Equity Assessment Toolkit, which is also called HEAP a software application to explore and compare health inequalities, and the WHO handbook and step-by-step -step manuals on health inequality monitoring, resources to strengthen and guide the development of health inequality monitoring. Dr. Hoysenpour's presentation is entitled, Whose Work on uh, Health Inequality Monitoring? I'm, uh, my apologies, that's WHO's Work on Health Inequality Monitoring. And I'm just going to go back and see uh, if we have the answers to those poll questions here that I can that I can summarize. There we go. Okay. So. Very interesting. We have about seven, uh, sixty percent of our attendees from Ontario. Uh, nine percent are from British Columbia. We have nine percent from Quebec. Seven percent from the Prairie Provinces: Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. Fourteen percent from the Atlantic Provinces. Um, and in terms of the key role uh, and job title that are represented, we have 28% researchers, 9% policy analysts, 7% students, 42% epidemiologists and surveillance specialists, and 19% other. Uh, in terms of the organizations they're representing, we have 77% from federal, provincial, and municipal governments, and 2% from industry, 2% for nonprofit, 14% from the university sector and 5% from other. And for uh, what, what participants are hoping to gain from today's event, 42% uh, are hoping to gain um, sharing and making connections. 77% are hoping to learn new methods. 67% uh, would like to have a better understanding of the social determinants of health. And 28% would like to know more about what CARFS is all about. So thank you very much guys for answering that. That's really, really interesting. Thank you very much. And I think we're going to start right into our, our keynote talk here. Thank you so much, Catherine. Just checking if you can hear me well. Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Excellent. So let me share my screen. I hope I can do it right. Here we go. You should be able to see my screen, just um, checking with. I can see it perfectly. Oh, amazing. So uh, thank you so much again for this wonderful introduction. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which I'm presenting in Montreal is the unceded indigenous territory of the Ghanaian Hakka Mohawk Nation. Montreal is historically known as a gathering place for various First Nations. And as such, we deeply recognize and appreciate the historical and ongoing Indigenous connection to and presence on these lands and waters. I'm really thrilled uh, by this opportunity to introduce today's topic, um, highlighting the importance of uh, surveillance and monitoring for health equity in public health. And so before turning to my uh, the stage to my co-presenters, I will try to situate the uh, concept and practice of surveillance for um, health equity within its current and historical context. I, I think many of us will agree that the public health field has increasingly, especially in the past 20 years, uh, recognize the importance of studying and understanding the role uh, of social determinants of health on health and health um, on health equity. In its landmark uh, 2008 report, uh, the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health identified health equity monitoring as part of the essential backbone of effective public health action. The Commission recommended at uh, that all member states, including Canada, um, establish a national equity surveillance system with routine collection of data on social determinants of health and health equity. 
And so at the heart of this recommendation was the understanding that public health surveillance data is critical resource. It's critical for making the case for action on the underlying uh, uh, drivers of health inequities. It's critical for knowing where to act <clears throat> and whether those interventions were effective um, uh, in reaching those most in need. Uh, yet, uh, this idea of using quantitative data to draw the link between public health outcomes and social determinants of health isn't new. In fact, the field of public health surveillance has always concerned itself with how social and economic conditions shape public health. And this goes all the way back to the early 19th century. Here's an example. Uh, in the mid-1820s, Louis-René Villermé, a French physician and one of the founders of modern social epidemiology, produced one of the earliest uh, empirical studies linking population health to underlying social and economic conditions. He was drawing on Parisian census data and published a series of reports on mortality rates based on the degree of poverty at the neighborhood level. In his work, he demonstrated not only a correlation, but a robust, what we call today, social gradient in health. Similarly, in the early 1840s, William Allison, a Scottish uh, physician, professor, and uh, pioneering social reformer, he drew on statistical data as well on his own clinical experience in treating typhoid fever and other infectious diseases. He advocated to Scottish lawmakers to alleviate poverty as a direct means to reduce the frequency and severity of epidemic outbreaks uh, at the time. On this particular slide, uh, the quotation comes from a report published by Allison in 1840, and in it he outlines his view. That is, it was the socioeconomic deprivation rather than deficient moral character, which was a popular view at the time, that was the main driver of high rates of ill health, uh, which were commonly observed about, among the poor in the UK. Uh, this table comes from his subsequent study of the 1843 epidemic fever in Scotland, and it's illustrating the difference in disease incidence by employment status of patients in the three uh, Glasgow area hospitals. He looked at the uh, fever among those with precarious employment, those who were who, whose employment was often suspended or was a little profitable. Today, we would have to admit that it employs a flawed uh, statistical argument, but at the time, using statistics to build an evidence-based argument for policy action was quite a novel and convincing approach. But the recognition of the social determinants of health in these early days of modern public health surveillance is extended well beyond issues of poverty and unemployment. For example, here's an excerpt from the 1850 report by Lemuel Shattuck. Uh, he was a state legislator in Massachusetts, and he helped to co-found the American Statistical Association. He had been asked to prepare a plan for the states of Massachusetts to conduct a sanitary uh, survey. That is technically speaking, a population health survey. And in his report, published nearly 175 years ago, he noted that public health actors then were already well aware of the public health and well being. Quote, it depends on various other characteristics, not possessed by all populations alike or in the same degree, unquote. So he recommended that these social characteristics not. <clears throat> which includes social, um, racial identity, immigration status, uh, housing conditions, among others, should be collected during every state census. And he, and this would enable what we would call uh, today, a disaggregated data analysis and reporting to inform equitable uh, public health action. I'm sure you have noticed freedom on this list. This is pretty upstream structural determinant of health. 
uh, you probably also noticed concepts uh, such as um, um, comfort, which is pretty interesting concept, somehow close to the well-being concepts of today. I would like to also highlight the title of this report, Report of a General Plan for the Promotion of Public and Personal Health. So that this recognition of the need of upstream public health action, as well as individual level approaches is already captured in a title from 1850. And so from its beginnings, modern public health surveillance has always looked to upstream social and economic conditions and circumstances to orient, help explain or identify more effective interventions to to the downstream public health problems. And this practice continues to this day, as most recently seen during COVID-19 pandemic. These two charts come from a Toronto Public Health COVID-19 data dashboard, showing a clear differences in COVID-19 cases by racial identity and a clear social gradient in COVID-19 hospitalizations by income. I think we can appreciate how clear that is that we need to continue to monitor inequities in health by collecting socioeconomic and um, demographic information. And so the same relationship between social and material deprivation and COVID-19 mortality are observed at the global scale. This chart shows the rate ratios for COVID-19 mortality between uh, people living in the most uh, deprived areas compared to those living in the least deprived areas for 11 OECD countries, Organization for Economic Co Cooperation and Development countries. <clears throat> so to summarize, in Canada and around the world, efforts to strengthen health equity surveillance systems and, and practice uh, remain vital and ongoing. Different nations uh, have adopted different strategies and outputs. Uh, this slide captures just a few examples, but the common goal remains the same, and that is to fully embed health equity and social determinants of health into their country's public health surveillance systems. At the Public Health Agency of Canada, we continue to do this work through systematic analysis and reporting of disaggregated public health and social determinants of health data. Dr. Maza will um, showcase a little bit more in details this work. Um, we also um, engage through collaborative partnerships and outreach efforts, as well as multiple capacity and knowledge uh, building initiatives. And so with this, uh, next, um, to take a deeper dive specifically into the data, I'll turn it back to you, Catherine, to introduce Dr. Julia Mazza. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we will have uh, Dr. Julia Mazza, who is a senior epidemiologist in the Health Equity Policy Division of the Public Health Agency of Canada. She received her training in epidemiology from the Université de Montréal. She has conducted epidemiological research on understanding mental health inequalities across the life course with a focus on children and youth. Uh, and she will be presenting today on monitoring health inequalities in Canada, an overview of the Pan-Canadian Health Inequalities Data Tool. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Can you hear me well? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Perfect. Thank you for the introduction. You are too kind. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging that I am presenting to you today from Montreal, uh, which is located in the traditional and unceded territory of the eight communities that make up the Ken and Kahaka Nation. For those who have been to Montreal before, I am located along the St. Lawrence River and in proximity with the Lachine Rapid, Rapids, which is considered one of the island's um, largest archaeological sites where First Nations occupation can be traced back over 5,000 years, just showing that Montreal is a historically known place uh, for many First Nations. And um, in the spirit of friendship and solidarity, uh, I am very grateful for this opportunity to thank all the generations of people that have taken care of the land on which I happily live and work and present to you today. 
Um, I might just greet the audience by sharing that I am delighted to be here today um, and share our experiences and insights on health inequalities, monitoring and reporting activities um, in Canada. And with that, I'll start sharing my screen. I hope it works. Let me know when it's okay. Okay, we can see that. Okay, excellent. So we're now going to go into the health inequalities data tool itself. So the data tool was launched in 2017, and it is a product of the Pan-Canadian Health Inequalities Reporting Initiative. I will walk you through a few examples so you have you can have a better sense of the features, the indicators, the um, disaggregation dimensions that we have available, um, and some of the inequality measures as well. To quickly sum up, it is our Pan-Canadian Health Equity Surveillance Platform, and it houses um, more than 160 indicators that are systematically disaggregated or stratified or organized, if you will, by up to 20 population groups that are meaningful to health equity. Um, so here is our landing page. Um, it is an interactive statistical resource that allows users to identify the inequalities across population groups at the national and at the provincial and territorial level, and in some instances at the regional level, and to determine the size of the magnitude of the inequalities being experienced. Uh, one can download um, save charts and the data and uh, data files related to the inequalities being under investigation for further manipulation. So yeah, just keep that in mind as well um, as a user. So let's start exploring a few examples. I will walk you through the drop-down menu here to get my results. I will focus for the most part on our 2022 um, edition where we have our newest indicators. And I will focus on the results at the national level, but uh, if you're interested in looking at those by province and territorial regions, it's also possible uh, under the geography drop-down menu. Um, our indicators are organized by 12 framework components. Uh, they are divided by two domains. So we have health uh, health status, uh, but we also whoops, we also have um, health determinants, uh, more of those uh, upstream health determinants, but we downstream um, the ter health determinants, and then we have more of those upstream. Um, social determinants of health, including early childhood development and socioeconomic conditions. Um, and uh, then we have our set of indicators available under a given framework component. I'll select anxiety disorder for now. Um, you will note as I go through the examples that the information available in the data tool, it's a mix of administrative data sources, census survey data, and also surveillance systems. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to note that uh, you can select the life course approach, the stage of life on which you're interested. I'll select adults for now. And then you have uh, the list of um, disaggregation dimension, the stratifiers available for a given um, indicator. For the most part, our indicators are stratified at the individual levels, but we also use ecological stratifiers or small areas or area-based measures as an alternative um, when individual level characteristics are not available, which is often the case for um, administrative data sources. And then here we have our uh, drop-down menu for the inequality measures. Um, we have a total of six summary measures, including both absolute and relative measures, uh, such as rate ratio or uh, rate difference, but we also have uh, more complex measures um, that reflects the inequality within the total population, um, such as uh, population impact number. I will not uh, go over each um, measure. I won't bore you by reading the definitions out loud, but um, I'll just point out that we do have a technical guide um, under this hyperlink here. I'll go here. So you will find all the six measures um, laid out in terms of the definitions, um, the applicability, examples, how to interpret them. So feel free to 
explore this resource at your own pace uh, or as needed. So I'll just go back to the data tool now. Um, and a second point I'd like to mention since we were talking about summary measures is that um, measuring and monitoring health inequalities requires both absolute and relative measures whenever possible. And the reason why I am reiterating this, it's that um, they, they may diverge in the magnitude and the direction of change. Um, essentially, they measure different things and they should be presented alongside um, inequality data whenever possible to provide that more comprehensive, uh, complete picture. So for my first example, as I mentioned before, I will focus on anxiety disorder by income quintiles. So here we ranked people's income into from lowest income to the highest income, and then we divided them in roughly five equal, equal groups of 20% of the population. So um, yeah, so you, you would get our lowest income group and we have our highest income group, which is our um, reference group. So I'll just explore start exploring a couple of basic measures, including the age standardized rate, because it is our building block for the inequality measures that I just alluded earlier. Um, and then I was slowly moving to um, relative inequalities and um, absolute inequalities using uh, prevalence ratio and then uh, prevalence difference. So um, what I'm looking here is that, uh, is that the prevalence adjusted by age, accounting for that distribution of age. And we can see that for both sex in yellow, um, the prevalence is highest among those in the lowest income group, Q1. I'll just select males and females for now to make this easier. Um, so what we're also seeing here, it's that there is a clear social gradient um, where the prevalence of anxiety disorder decreases as income increases, going all the way down to almost 6% in the highest income group. Um, so in other words, people who are less advantaged in terms of income level, they have worse health because they're reporting higher um, anxiety disorder prevalence. Um, than those who are more advantaged. So if I bring back males and females to the fold, uh, my computer might lag a bit. So my apologies, oh, it's up. Um, and then this select both sex, we can see that the gradient still holds true for male in green and for females in blue, and that it's even more pronounced um, for females. If we look at um, inequalities, relative inequalities, um, and at that prevalence ratio that I mentioned earlier, uh, that is dividing the um, age standardized prevalence of our group of interest, our Q1, uh, by the prevalence, uh, the age standardized prevalence of our reference group, Q5, uh, we get that uh, that rate ratio. We don't have to do that by hand by hand or or mentally, because uh, you just need to click at the drop down menu and select that measure. Uh, so, what we're seeing here is that the prevalence of um, anxiety disorder in the lowest income group, Q1, Q1 it's 2.4 times higher that of the um, highest income group and our reference category. In terms of absolute inequalities, this translates into um, eight more individuals um, living with anxiety disorder per every 100 individuals in the lowest income group compared to the reference group, um, our highest income group. And lastly, allow me to whoops, allow me to direct you to one of those complex measures that I uh, mentioned before. Um, that is the magnitude of inequality between the two groups doing our pairwise comparison, but within the total population. So if we look at the population impact number, uh, both sex, uh, we can see that the pin corresponds to 431,000 um, anxiety disorder cases that could have been avoided 
um, if somehow in a hypothetical situation as a society, we were in a position where those in the lowest income group had the same prevalence as those in the highest um, income group. So that's that for my first example. I'll move on to my second one, which is uh, which will be um, self-reported diabetes. Um, bear with me for a moment so I find it. Uh, so here it is. I'll look again um, at um, inequalities by uh, by income. So I think you can see it. I'll take you back to one of our to our building block, the age standardized <clears throat> rates. And um, again, what we're seeing here is that for those in the lowest income group, the age standardized prevalence is at ten point five percent, and that at the those in the highest income group for the both for both sex um, in yellow, it is um, about five point two percent. If we do that uh, prevalence ratio and look into relative inequalities, um, what we will find out is that the prevalence it's two, the prevalence ratio it's two o two, which indicates that it is twice uh, as high in the lowest income group compared to that reference group. Um, and if I bring if we look into males and females, we can see that. Um, the uh, the inequalities uh, when looking at the intersection between uh, sex and income, we see that the inequalities in diabetes are observed uh, are, are are still holds true for male and females, and it's even more pronounced now for uh, for females. So let's see if we can find the same patterns with absolute inequalities in absolute measures. So in terms of the rates difference uh, for both sex. We this would translate into five more individuals in the lowest income group um, having um, diabetes compared to those in the highest um, income group for every 100 individuals living um, in Canada. Okay, for my third example, I will take you back in time and then go to our 2017 edition. I'll just wait a second for it to load. And I'll take you to um, look into absolute inequalities in terms of life expectancy by income. This time, however, we are going to look at income as an area-based um, measure. Uh, in other words, we basically classified individuals um, by where they live using postal code information. And in terms of neighborhood socioeconomic characteristics, in this case, income. So I'll select my income quintiles, an area-based measure, and then I'll look at the um, um, absolute inequalities. I'll deselect male and female for now. Um, so in a nutshell, what we're seeing here is that in Canada, people living in the lowest income neighborhoods will on average die four years earlier than people living in the highest income group um, in our reference category. This is also telling us um, about a finally graded relationship between socioeconomic characteristics at the neighborhood level, um, again, in terms of income and life expectancy. Um, put it simply, people in the poorest areas, they die sooner. Uh, and if I bring back males and females uh, to the fold, um, we can see that the gradient once again still holds true and that the gradient is even steeper among uh, males in, um, as we can see in the green bars. Um, again, I know I sound like a broken record, but I just wanted to reiterate that these findings apply to the dissemination area level, the neighborhood level, and not at the individual level. And for my next example, we're going to still go, we still use the 2017 edition and look into um, inequalities that exist in active, TB, active tuberculosis by sex and by origin of cases. And in TB, it's a priority for Canada. So we, I thought it would be interesting to showcase this indicator. Um, 
So when looking at case reported information, what we're seeing here is that men, they have um, incidence rate of TB uh, that it's 30% higher uh, than females. And if we look at TB by origin of cases, so I'll just select origin here as my disaggregation dimension. And, um, and if we look at those complex measures, the population impact number, um, that is the magnitude of the inequalities between the two groups, but within the total population. Um, what the pain is telling us is that if the rate of TB of tuberculosis was this among foreign born individuals was the same as our reference group, that is Canadian born and non-indigenous individuals, there would be fewer uh, 1,043 cases annually. Um, and among all indigenous groups, this would represent Three, 319 cases, uh, fewer cases annually. In other words, uh, this reflects how many tuberculosis cases could have been avoided in a total population if somehow, as a society, uh, those two groups had the same um, incidence as the reference group. Um, before I move on to my next example, I just want to point out for a distinction-based approach, uh, Please note that further disaggregation is available, uh, can be conducted for, um, for the indicators by First Nation, Inuit, and Métis um, individuals. So you just need to select um, here under the, the drop down menu. All righty. So um, I will, I've been talking for a while now, and um, I will suggest that we switch gears. So far, um, the examples were mainly focused on health outcomes, and then the next step now is to look into the upstream approaches of health and well-being. In other words, just how can we stop people from falling into that river, falling to the cliff and becoming ill in the first place? So we really need to start thinking about um, the settings and the conditions in which people are born and live rather than the behaviors to contextualize the inequalities we just saw in terms of anxiety disorder, diabetes, life expectancy, and TB. So I am going to suggest that we broaden the scope of this exercise. And um, to do that, I will provide some findings from the social determinants of health indicators um, that can be used to advance um, upstream efforts and actions. So for my next set of examples, I will focus on inequalities in terms of food insecurity, inadequate housing, um, and um, children living in poverty, this time by racialized um, populations, by cultural and racial uh, background. So for my first example, I will take you to inadequate housing, living in core housing needs, it's the indicator, and then I'll take you back to, I'll go straight to relative inequalities. I'll deselect males and females for now. I hope it's loading. Yeah, I think so. Um, okay, so what we're seeing here is that in Canada, racialized communities are disproportionately impacted by inequalities um, in terms of um, inadequate housing compared to our reference category, which is white individuals. Um, more specifically, Arab, West, and Asian only, and Black communities are the most affected, as you can see, compared to white individuals, uh, black communities have 2.3 times um, higher um, prevalence uh, of inadequate housing. And uh, for Arab, West and Asian um, individuals, that translates in almost three times um, a higher prevalence than the reference group. If I go to my drop down menu and select rate difference for um, absolute inequalities, this translates, I'll just select males and females. This translates into um, 12 more Arab West and Asian adults and eight more um, black adults living in inadequate housing for, one for 100 individuals in, in Canada. Okay, so I will take a look now at inequalities in terms of food insecurity. Um, perhaps food insecurity is one of the most commonly discussed um, social determinants of health in terms of um, in, in, in face of climate change and production disruption due to more extreme weather events. 
um, and also it's an important indicator for um, in light of the rising cost of living in, in Canada. So um, I will deselect males and females. Um, what we're seeing here is that the pr prevalence of food insecurity um, among adults in Black communities, in Black communities and among First Nations, Inuit and Métis um, is the highest across all racialized groups in Canada. Um, both communities that have a 2.8 higher rate uh, compared to the reference group, white individuals. And in terms of the absolute inequalities in terms of our prevalence difference, uh, this would translate into more um, th almost 13 individuals uh, uh, in Black communities experiencing food insecurity and um, the same magnitude for First Nations, Inuit and Métis communities um, experiencing food insecurity per 100 um, individuals in Canada. I will now move on very quickly to my last example and take you back to the 2017 edition. I'll put up um, childhood poverty according to the market basket measure, which is Canada's official poverty line. So here it is. Um, so I'll put up rate, uh, the prevalence ratio. Um, so much like we saw with inadequate housing and food insecurity, this is telling us that um, racialized individuals in Canada are disproportionately um, impacted by uh, poverty during during childhood. Uh, First Nations, I'll scroll up a bit. Uh, First Nations, Inuit and Métis uh, communities and Black communities are the most impacted. Um, I will note as well that um, the prevalence of uh, the, the relative inequalities in, in childhood poverty were similar among males and females, as you can see here. Um, more specifically, compared to white individuals, the proportions of those living in childhood poverty was 2.7 times higher among Black individuals and um, 2.8 times higher among uh, First Nation Inuit and Métis. And if we look at the population impact number uh, and that to quantify that potential reduction in the total number of cases um, in a population, we can see that if the prevalence of childhood poverty among all indigenous uh, groups was the same as white individuals, this would translate into 97,000 fewer cases of children living in poverty in Canada. And uh, for um, Arab, South and West Asian communities, this would represent almost um, 70, 71,000 fewer cases struggling to get that out um, of childhood poverty in Canada. And for Black communities, this would translate into 50,000 uh, fewer cases. Um, and just before wrapping up, I will use this opportunity to note that the inequalities we saw in TB, in housing, food insecurity, and here with childhood poverty um, among First Nation Inuit and Métis population are a direct result of colonial policies and practices that included loss of lands, banning of indigenous languages and cultures, cultural practices, um, and also the creation of the um, residential school system. Okay, so I think so far we have produced some good evidence um, of the, and good leads of for measuring and monitoring health inequalities in Canada. But I will also um, encourage you to visit our publication tab, uh, Housing Other Products from the Health Inequalities Reporting Initiative. There are a number of infographics, narrative report, checklist, Q&As. There is an overview of the data tool. So um, there's a lot of content there that could complement these findings and fit into your work. And um, with that, I believe that concludes my session. Uh, thank you for listening and I'll pass it back to Catherine for um, next steps. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Meza.
And next we have Dr. Ahmed Reza Hosenplor, who is a medical doctor and an epidemiologist working at the World Health Organization in Geneva, where he leads the work on health and equality monitoring. He has conceptualized and coordinated the development of resources and tools in this area, including the Health Inequality Data Repository, the WHO Global Platform for Disaggregated Health Data, the WHO Health Equity Assessment Toolkit, HEAP, and a software application to explore and compare health inequalities, and the WHO Handbook and Step-by-Step -step Manuals on Health Inequality Monitoring, resources to strengthen and guide the development of health inequality monitoring. Uh, Dr. Heisenpour's presentation is entitled WHO's work on health inequality monitoring. Thanks very much, Catherine. Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here and present the WHO work on health inequality monitoring. So, as uh, Gosha mentioned, so the question is that why actually we monitor inequality? Why not just national? Averages enough. National averages, it may not provide the full picture of the situation. As this image illustrates, providing information only about the average depth of the river may actually provoke a wrong action. Similar things may happen in public health. So we monitor health inequality to track differences between population subgroups. In that sense, we may identify who is left behind and also notice the points for addressing health inequalities. So this evidence actually could inform equity-oriented policies, programs, and interventions to tackle these inequities and finally achieve equity. So equity is at the heart of WHO's work. Serving the vulnerable is one of the three pillars of the WHO's 13 general program of work. Also, equity is at the center of sustainable development agenda with the no leave one behind aspiration. So this commitment is reflected in all SDGs, including SDG 10, as well as SDG 1, 3, 4, and 5. The target 17.18 calls for uh, gathering disaggregated data that are high quality reliable. So to achieve equity, first we need actually to know where those inequalities exist. Recognizing the importance of monitoring health inequality, WHO has developed a strategy to help countries and global health partners to monitor these qualities to tackle inequities. So within that, we have three strategic uh, goals in the strategy. The first is actually to provide capacity building for countries and global health partners. We also develop and disseminate the latest evidence on state of inequality. And we develop uh, tools, resources, methods for measuring and monitoring health inequalities. So regarding capacity building, we have developed a series of e-learning courses on the OpenWHO platform. So that includes a series on health inequality monitoring foundation which covers the whole cycle of health inequality monitoring from defining the framework to obtaining data, to analyzing data, reporting, and to knowledge translation. We also developed several thematic uh, health inequality monitoring courses in immunization, HIV, TB, tuberculosis, and malaria, and also in sexual, reproductive, and maternal health. And very soon in a month, we're releasing several courses on skill building using Excel, Stata, and R to allow users to do uh, health equity analysis with these tools. Also, whenever we get requests from countries and regions, we do training workshops. Uh, we used to do a lot 
uh, in person in countries and since COVID we shifted also to have online capacity buildings, online training workshops. And right now we started planning uh, a synchronous course that hopefully we are going to, to test and pilot by end of the year. We also develop uh, evidence on health inequality monitoring. Just over a month ago, we released WHO Health Inequality Data Repository, which is the largest global collection of disaggregated data ever. So it includes about 60 data sets and contains more than 200, 2,000 indicators disaggregated by up to 22 inequality dimensions. And apart from WHO sources, it covers 15 other public data sources that are global or regional. We also developed several global thematic reports on inequality and immunization, uh, reproductive matter on child health, and two years back also a global report on a state of inequality in HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria, and also several uh, national reports. One of the most comprehensive one was done in 2017 uh, in the And we developed uh, tools and methods simply because we cannot reach all countries. This way, we systematically provide these tools and resources so that everyone can access them publicly. So one of these one is the handbook. It's like a textbook of health inequality measuring that we published in 2013, and it was translated to different languages, to Spanish, French, and Arabic. And we are actually now developing the second edition of the handbook that is going to be published next year, thanks to funding that Public Health Agency of Canada provided. We also developed several step-by-step -step manuals, which is more practical way of how each country could do inequality monitoring. Uh, it's several guides and providing questions and also some workbook to be able to do that at each level providing also a statistical codes for equity analysis. And one of the tools that I'm going to provide you with the live demonstration in a minute, it's Health Equity Assessment Toolkit, which is a software application that allows users to look at inequality data and assess within country inequality. So what is important is that as all we know, to achieve equity, we really need to do equity analysis regularly at global, national, subnational level. And all we need to look at it over time. So one of the ways that we could do that and look at the data is basically using some toolkit that helps us to facilitate data analysis and reporting inequality. So with that, I'm just going to shift gears to a live demonstration toolkit and to see some sort of storytelling about uh, inequality in some countries, especially in Canada and comparing it with other countries. So let me just share my screen. So that's basically the homepage for Health Equity Assessment Toolkit. And that's the link to the online version of that that we have. So here we can choose different data sets that we can have. So as I told you, we have 59 data sets here from where we can from which we can choose 
which data we want to look. Let's look at SDG data sets. And the tool uh, opens the data set for us. Here, basically, as we can see, the toolkit is around two concepts, explore inequality and compare inequality. In explore inequality, the users enable to assess the situation of inequality in the country of interest. So it's just one country. In compare inequality, we can compare within country inequality in our country of interest with some other similar countries. So let's start with explore inequality. And within that, we can look at disaggregated data and also summary measures of inequality. As uh, Dr. Meza mentioned, we need to look at both disaggregated data and summary measures to be able to get a full picture of situation of inequality. So the tool provides with different type of visuals and table. If we look at the left hand side, we have the selection menu from which we can select our country of interest. Let me just call Canada. And we can pick up also our year and our indicator of interest. So I'm just picking up um, the prevalence of current tobacco use as an example. And we can pick up our dimension of inequality. As you can see here, we have different dimensions of inequality, but for tobacco use, we only have it by sex disaggregation the SDG database. So looking at the data simply, we can see that, uh, first of all, there are some gaps between females and males. And over the time, that gaps remained, and even it increased. We can also see the national average that is somehow in between that decreased over time. So that's the good news, as we can see in that figure. We can, of course, look at it from different angle, the vertical bar. We have several options to customize the visual that we have. For example, I can change the axis a bit to just show that how the visual may look like. As we can see here again, we can see in females, the gradient, the smoking decreased quite a lot, much more than it decreased in men. So that's something that we can see here. We can again get back to what we want. We can type the access, anything that is here we want to change. And we can download finally the graph as a paper or a PDF, put it in the report, or we can download the data behind that. Also, we can look at the summary measures of inequality. In this toolkit, it can provide us with up to 19 summary measures of inequality, which, whichever applies to our indicator and dimensions of inequality. So we can look at it by default as a difference between male and female that shows the situation. And we can also use, for example, in this case, ratio. So one being our reference line or no inequality between female and male, we can see increase in relative inequality over time. So let's move to compare inequality because on the explore inequality, most of the points was mentioned by Dr. Maza. So I just want to actually show how we can compare within country inequality across countries. If I go here to disaggregate data, then for smoking, we can see the inequality here first. By default, the toolkit picks up for us the countries from same region and same income group. So as we see in this visual, in some countries in this region and 
high income countries like Bahamas, inequalities between females and males are higher than Canada. And in some countries like Chile, the average is higher. We can also look at it using summary measure tabs. So that provides us with a scatter plot. In the x axis, we can see the national average of countries. And in the y axis, we can see the difference between male and female. So the higher the number, the higher the equality. So we can see Canada is here highlighted in orange. And when hover on the data, we can see further information. We can also go to the options here and pick up ISO 3. So we can see the label of the countries. So we can see, for example, Chile has the same level of inequality as Canada in terms of male female differences, but the national average is much higher, is about 30%. On the other hand, we can see some countries, we can see Bahamas has more or less the same national average as Canada, but large, much larger inequality between male and female. So this way we can actually do a benchmarking and see the situation of the country of our interest, in this case Canada, with similar countries in terms of the region or income group. I can change the situation, for example, I can pick up all high income countries. So let's pick up all the regions here. So in that sense, then we, I can see where Canada stands among 52 high income countries for which we have data about current tobacco use. So in that sense, then we can see actually Canada is among that quadrant, that is sort of the best quadrant. It has this quadrant, the less prevalence of smoking and also less inequality. And this quadrant has the highest average and highest inequality, as we see in some countries. We can also look at it in just the same region as Canada to just uh, America's continent. So let's look at it that way. If I pick up all the income countries in uh, Americas, then also I can see again the situation for Canada in Americas, where it stands. Let's also change another indicator, go to the another indicator. I'm going to pick up the same indicator that uh, we see before, food insecurity. So I'm just typing here food insecurity, and I'll just go with the prevalence of severe food insecurity in adult population. So we can see here, Canada actually stands on as sort of best countries. It has no inequality, almost, and very little uh, in terms of national average of severe insecurity, food insecurity. And there are some countries, as we expect, for example, here, Haiti has very high national average of severe food insecurity, but moderate level of inequality between uh, men and women. So almost everyone is affected. On the other hand, we can see, for example, countries like Jamaica, that have high inequality, sex-related inequality in severe food uh, insecurity. Let me check another indicator. So let's pick up an indicator of uh, health outcome, basic under five mortality that we have in the SDG data set. So again, Canada comes as one of the best countries with low national average, as we see here, and very little inequality. So zero is the best in terms of no difference between male and female, or boys and girls. And it has the highest level of under five mortality. We can look at uh, indicators by other dimensions of inequality. 
I'm going to pick up uh, another indicator from SDG data set that has data on other dimensions of inequality. So that's basically discrimination. So population reported uh, having felt discriminated against. And I'm just going to use disability status for that. So this is just five countries for which we have data in Latin America, in uh, Americas. Uh, let me add more countries to that. So let me actually pick up all the other regions for which we have data. So here we can see the situation in 21 countries for which we have this information. So feeling discriminated by a status of disability. And we can see here the situation is quite different in different countries. If we pick up Canada, Canada stays here. So lower than median value of these 21 countries in terms of national average of feeling discriminated, 13.3% of population for that. And the inequality is actually 11% percentage points. So meaning that the people uh, with disability actually felt discrimination 11 points further than people with no disability in Canada. We can see some countries with great situation in Denmark and in Georgia, the national average was quite low, 5% and inequality was also quite low. In some other countries, in Sweden, the inequality is in low, but the national average, the self-reported feeling on that was quite high. So this way, we can easily tell the stories on how is the situation of inequality within a country of interest, picking up different indicators and looking at them by different dimensions of inequality to really tell the story. And actually, we can also look at it over time to see how inequality has changed over time. And then we can do that comparison across other countries to do the benchmarking to see actually where our country of interest or setting of interest fits. So I'm going to shift again back to our uh, to the presentation. So the, these are some other examples that I'm going to skip. And if it's needed, we just go back to further uh, step on that. Just also wanted to tell you some other stories that could come from the toolkit. This is one of the analysis we did uh, to just show one of the misconceptions about health inequality. In many cases, I just hear that many people say that inequality has increased over time or has been increasing or the situation of health inequality is getting worse. Uh, in fact, it's not very true in many uh, health indicators. We could see actually over past several decades in many health indicators, the gap have narrowed down between and between countries. So this is one of the examples that uh, we picked up from the health inequality data repository to showcase. So that's basically showing the gap, uh, reach poor gap in health service coverage uh, on reproductive matter and child health. And showing that between actually two decades, uh, 2001 to 2010, and then 2011, 2020, when we look at that, poor rich gap, actually the inequality has nearly got halved. So that sort of, uh, the misconceptions comes from income inequality that is increasing, and then we just speculate that to health inequality. But the situation is not as bad as uh, perhaps the, that perception is. The fact is that still a lot of inequality 
as we see here in this case, there is still a gap that needs to be closed. But the situation over time has actually improved. So another thing that I would like also to mention here is that I just said we have data disaggregation in the data repository on over 2000 indicators, health indicators may sound quite good, which is good, but there's still many, many health indicators do not include data disaggregation. Uh, just to show the situation, if we just look at SDG indicators, um, only half of the eligible indicators, meaning that the indicators can be disaggregated, have actually disaggregated data in the global database. And if we just look at uh, health-related goals, less than half of the indicators have disaggregated data. So in many cases, missing disaggregation and in that sense, we just don't know who's left behind in terms of those indicators. If we look at our data repository, <laughs> whenever we have data disaggregation, in most cases it's disaggregated by sex and then uh, by age and place of residence. So in data repository, we have 87% disaggregation by sex and about 22 to 23% is aggregated by age and place of residence. And about 40 to 15% by education and wealth quintile, uh, which in most of cases is data coming from low and middle income countries, uh, international household surveys. But the fact is that for many other dimensions of inequality that are important, we really have a scarce data migratory status, ethnicity, religion, uh, all sorts of things. We have really disability. We have quite a small level of disaggregation. So this is also some information about the tool and our health equity, health inequality monitor page, where you can find all sorts of uh, tools, resources, and information about the data and also the toolkit that can play with to understand uh, the situation of inequality globally and within each country. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Heisenpour and all of our keynote speakers for that wonderful presentation. We do have a few minutes for questions and I noticed that there are a few questions coming in in our chat. Uh, we have a question here for Dr. Heisenpour. Could independent public health institute research or research groups request equity trainings from the WHO? Normally we provide um, training for member states, but that being said, we already provided all sorts of training publicly available as well. So if, for example, go to the Open WHO uh, platform, which is the platform for all sorts of trainees, we have a special ch channel there on health inequality monitoring, where we're providing actually all the e-learning course self-paced, and also anyone who pick up the, the e-learning courses, they could get a certificate out of it. But basically, we would like to provide this in the context of building capacities that is sustainable in the countries. So if that's the way that it's shown that the Institute is working with the Ministry of Health and improving the and strengthening the health information system in the country, that's definitely a possibility. Wonderful, thank you. And we have another question here for Dr. Heisenpour. Do you have a standard protocol for measuring and qualifying the change in inequities over time that could be shared? Yes, we have actually several um, guidelines, papers, and also in that handbook that I showed, we clearly mentioned what are the steps for monitoring inequality over time and how it should be measured and uh, reported. So I really encourage, I try to put 
uh, the link also in the chat. So in that sense, then apart from uh, the PowerPoint that I would share with you later on, uh, we could put the link to some of our resources here as well. Wonderful. And we have another question here for Dr. Heisenpour. Do you ensure that the indicators measured in surveys from different countries are comparable to make valid country level comparisons? For example, could measures of disability or food insecurity be measured differently in countries? Very good question. Yes, whenever we want to have global comparison or global monitoring of inequality or even national average, comparability is one of the most important factors and that's something that really matters so in many cases then the data sets that uh, so also i need to make it clear that in the data repository not all the data analysis actually are done by who we collated data from different organization but one of the important points here that we really paid attention to that to make sure the comparability of data sets. In, uh, in all the data sets that actually put for um, global monitoring, uh, they used common surveys across countries, common methodology to measure, for example, food insecurity or other indicators. We provided metadata for each of these indicators that clearly mention how uh, each indicator is calculated and which data sources are used and how the adjustments are done for comparability across countries. So that's very important factors when actually we want to compare the same indicators across many countries to make sure that uh, the indicators is using the same way of calculating of numerator, denominator, with same methodology and similar questionnaires in the surveys that they used. Wonderful. And the next question is for both Dr. Maza and Dr. Heisenpour. How were the indicators selected for your data tool? I can go first, I suppose. Um, yes, so I just wanted to quickly mention that the indicators housed in the data tool um, were selected based on recommendations from the Pan Canadian Public Health Network, PHN. Um, there was a report in 2010 uh, recommending um, a list, a set of indicators. Um, and then um, some of you may already be familiar with PHN. But I'll briefly note that the it is our formal public health government governance um, in Canada with federal, provincial, and territorial um, governments. But I'll just comment as well that among the criteria used to select those indicators, um, some of the requirements were that the indicators had to be reported by a, a full range of population groups that included socioeconomic status, income, education levels, sex, gender, um, place of residence, indigenous identity. Um, it also had to draw on data sources that were either currently available at the national, provincial level and regional level as well. And they could be developed. If there was a feasibility about the indicators. And then lastly, I'll mention that um, indicators had to reflect federal, provincial, um, and territorial priority areas, um, policy areas of interest. Uh, so just, just to name a few of the criteria that were used to select um, those indicators. So well, back to you, Catherine. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll pass it over to Ahmad. Yeah. Uh, for our data repository, we had several criteria. Uh, of course, some of them are obvious. The data should have disaggregation and it should include health indicators or health determinant. But also we had in mind to have global perspective or regional perspective. So at this phase, we didn't include single country or limited number of countries in the database. So any databases that included their sort of global or at least regional level data, 
Quality was also quite important, checking that the data are, has high quality up to date and also publicly available. So whatever we inserted, we collected and put in the data repository is also originally publicly available. And another criteria that we use is basic method of uh, getting the data. So if the data are in the proper data set, then we collated and included that. The data sets that are just in PDF, for example, we didn't take because that's not the way to, to sort of extract the data from which. Uh, in a couple of weeks, actually, I can share with you, we uh, publishing the whole methodology of uh, our collation of data in International Journal of Epidemiology in the data source profile uh, feature. That what are the, what were the criteria and how we're actually approached to this project. And it used and also way forward because we're going to ex expand the database as well. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And we have another question here for Dr. Meza. What kinds of expertise are required to develop the data tool? Epidemiologists, computer software engineers, et cetera? Um, that is that quite covered it. Yeah. So our team, it's, uh, we have um, a very vast pool of talent. So we are a team of um, epidemiologists, um, policy um, colleagues. We also have um, a team that supports with the data visualization. So yeah, computer software engineers. Um, and um, I think that's, that's it. But yes, the, yeah, Jing, you, you nailed it. Wonderful. And we have another question here. Um, has the sex and gender based analysis plus framework informed the development of the health inequities data tool? And this is also for Dr. Meza. That's an excellent question. Um, I'll just start in by saying that, that the sex gender based um, analysis plus it's one of the domestic policy drivers for the health inequalities reporting initiative enterprise the data tool it's one of the products uh, but there are a number of other products like i mentioned in that publication tab um i shown i had shown in the data tool that um, the disaggregate the disaggregation dimension of our indicators can be done by sex uh, male and female but i'll note that as national surveys um, carried over usually by Statistics Canada, you start to incorporate broader categories of gender. Um, we will ingest that data into our data tool uh, and make it available publicly. Um, at this time, for instance, in the 2022 edition, um, the data tool has indicators from the Canadian Housing Survey um, and you can find this aggregation of the housing indicators by male, female, and other. Uh, so there's that other gender category. And for the most part, the housing indicators, they can be disaggregated by um, two-spirited, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and plus identity. Um, so there's that additional um, disaggregation dimension as well. And um, I'll just end by saying that stratifying by sex and gender, along with other stratifiers, um, like income in one of the examples that I gave, um, will, have, will help and contribute to a more nuanced understanding of the inequalities and support um, SGBA plus um, analysis and um, intersectionality uh, in the federal health portfolio. Um, I hope that gives you a little bit of a flavor of the scope of that um, SGBA plus analytical approach in the data tool. And uh, yeah, I'll pass it over to you, Catherine, for um, our next question. Wonderful. Thank you. And our next question is, how is this evidence uh, slash data being leveraged? In other words, how are the data tools being used to inform action and decision making? And this is for both Dr. Meza and Dr. Hosenpour. I can go first. Um, so the data tool, 
has informed policy making at the national level, um, including within the, the agency, within the Public Health Agency of Canada, but also other um, federal government departments. A few examples that come to mind, um, I think it has informed uh, memorandums, memorandum of cabinet of food policy, enhancing food literacy. Um, some of you may already know, but um, memorandums of cabinet are developed when a minister is seeking a cabinet decision on a policy proposal. Um, I will also note that data from information from the data tool and related products also um, were used for a policy on place-based strategies to engage with rural, urban, and uh, remote communities across Canada. And it has also informed the federal LGBTQS plus action plan. And so that was on the policy side. I will also note that the information from the data tool has informed public health um, programming um, in terms of design, implementation, and evaluation. Um, some of the examples that I can give is the Mental Health of Black Canadians Fund. Uh, there was the Vaccine Challenge Program the Health Canadians Community Fund. Um, and at the international level, we the data tool has also been used for uh, to inform PAHO's, the Pan-American Health Organization um, strategy plan for ethnicity and health from 2019 to 2030. So I think that's all the examples that I have for now. Um, I hope this information is on how this information is being applied and used domestically and internationally, but mainly for publicly, uh, for uh, policymaking and programming. And um, I think that's it. I'll pass it back to Dr. Heinzapur. Okay, thanks very much, Julia. So uh, one major use of the data, disaggregated data and the tool to have is actually to strengthen and make equity related the health information system of countries. Uh, just to give you a statistic on that, a report that WHO published in 2020 showed that only half of the countries included data disaggregation and inequality data in their annual and national health sector performance review. So half of the country is missing the data. So we really aiming to strengthen that capacity in the countries because until we don't measure inequality and don't know where they are, then nothing can be done in terms of tackling inequities. So one major work that we do is basically working with countries to make sure that they get the capacity to collect, analyze, and uh, report on this aggregated data. In that case, we've been working with many countries. And one of the examples that I just showed also in the presentation that the country report that was developed with, with Indonesia to just guide where inequalities are. We also worked with other global health partners like Gavi and Global Fund to just provide the global status of inequality in some of the health topics that are important. And mainly the data could be also used and is being used in countries to really track the interventions. So basically, I can provide you one example. So in many African countries, we can see that uh, with data that malaria incidence and prevalence are more uh, concentrated among the poor. That leads the intervention for distributing the bed net to actually target those population, the poor population and the population where uh, the prevalence is higher. So in that sense, basically, it's a point for making the intervention to be delivered to the right people. And then following those interventions to see how 
that situation is going to change over time. Thank you. Thank you. And we have another question here for Dr. Meza. Um, how are the estimates for excess cases produced? And is a description of the modeling procedure available on the data tool website? I, I'm, I'm not sure I followed the question, but maybe the person meant the, the def, how is how do we calculate the population impact number? That is the the potential reduction of cases. So I can direct you to that um, technical guide. We do have the um, the definition of the um, the measure, which is um, um, laid out that the, we have a formula and how how we interpreted it. But we use the um, the number in the population, the proportion in the total population experience in that outcome. Um, and I'm not sure about the modeling piece. I don't think I have presented anything on the modeling. But I'm happy to take this question offline and then yeah, shoot me an email if my if my question is not necessarily clear. Wonderful. Yes, we can we can plan that for afterward. And we do have uh, one last question for Dr. Meza. I noticed the 2022 edition of the data tool includes 2015 to 2016 CCHS and Census 2016 data. Why are WHO data more up to date? Um, so 2020 and beyond. When will the health inequities data tool cover inequalities during the pandemic period or be updated? So I can go um, first. Um, yes, we do have a couple of indicators that will cover the pandemic period, and then they will be uploaded uh, this summer between um, the end of August, by the end of August, hopefully. Um, yes, so I think that was the first question. What was the first, qu the second question? The second so that, was the, that was the second question. Uh, yeah, so all that to say that, yeah, we are planning, we, do, we have produced the analysis and then we're in the process of uploading those new indicators covering the, um, the pandemic period. We're also planning to include um, change of um, inequalities over time um, for the uh, for next year. So this is in the works. And I see that Gosha had her camera um, on. So maybe mm -hmm. uh, you can add and complement some of my um, reactions. Mm -hmm. This is an excellent question. Thank you, uh, Celine uh, Plant from my NSPQ. Um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Ahmed, uh, the data that goes to WHO um, has mainly men and women uh, inequities. Uh, countries not necessarily provide health outcomes by income or race, ethnicity, or sexual orientation. So most of the data, at least that I looked at, is quite limited in terms of available um, disaggregations uh, for SDGs that you showed, Kate. Um, whereas our data tool, we wait for several cycles of, for instance, CCHS, um, to have enough of sample size to be able to actually disaggregate that information by first um, uh, province and territories, then let's say income or immigrant status, and then sex and gender. So we have this minimum threefold disaggregation, and that a little bit explains why we need to wait for a sufficient number of cycles to be able to populate our data tool. Um, so I hope that helps as well to, to clarify a little bit why we have a little bit of a jet lag um, compared to WHO platform. Thank you. And just to clarify, will these uh, presentations uh, be made available to the, to the audience today? The slide decks? Yes. Wonderful. Certainly. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And it doesn't look like we have uh, other questions coming in. So I, I really want to thank our keynote speakers. That was a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. And uh, we're going to move on to our first uh, rapid fire presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, everyone.
Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. And next we have our first rapid fire presentation and that will be followed by a, a very brief question period. Our first rapid fire presentation will be by Menet Komiha. Uh, it's from Upstream, she's from Upstream Lab, which is the MAP Center for Urban Health Solutions at St. Michael's Hospital, uh, Uni Unity Health in Toronto. And the presentation is Lessons Learned from the Introduction of Robust Sociodemographic socio Data Collection by Ontario Public Health Unit staff during the COVID-19 pandemic. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, so I will just share my screen. Well, hello and welcome to our presentation titled Lessons Learned from the Collection of Sociodemographic Data During the COVID-19 Pandemic. This is a collaborative project that was carried out by the Abstream Lab of St. Michael's Hospital, Field Public Health and Ottawa Public Health. My name is Mena Kumiha and I'm a research assistant with the Abstream Lab and joining me today are Greg Kujibira and Ayin Reynolds. Kindly note that the results and recommendations presented today are preliminary in nature. To the First Nations, the original people of this land who have resisted colonization for over 500 years, the project team gratefully acknowledges funding received from Public Health Ontario through the Locally Driven Collaborative Projects Program. Here is a quick overview of our agenda for the day that will include the objectives of this project, the methods used, and our findings. So when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, community leaders, health organizations, and public health professionals anticipated that racialized communities were going to be hit harder than the rest of the population, and thus advocated for the collection of sociodemographic data as part of their case management efforts. In response to that, several public health units in Ontario started collecting sociodemographic data before the provincial mandate to collect in June of 2021. Our objective was to better understand the existing disparities in the collection and use of sociodemographic data in public health in public in public health by examining the barriers and enablers that led to successful implementation and an observed high level of data completeness. We tackled our objective through investigating the following research question. So what public health unit led practices enabled higher levels of data completeness during the collection of sociodemographic data for COVID-19 case management and vaccine administration? 
Our project was divided into two phases. In the first phase, all 34 public health units in Ontario were invited to respond to a survey consisting of multiple choice and open-ended questions. The survey achieved a 100% completion rate, which was really amazing. To achieve this completion rate, we had some of the team members use the Association of Public Health Epidemiologists in Ontario a directory to directly reach out to potential participants. In the second phase, a combination of focus group discussions and the one-on-one -on -one interviews were conducted, which allowed for deeper insights and perspectives. The interviews were divided into four peer groups. We had uh, senior management, middle management, frontline staff, and the specialists. And the logic behind that was to really capture the tested experiences of each of the peer groups. A total of 24 interviews with 65 participants were carried out, which provided us with rich qualitative data that will um, complement the survey findings. So our findings were divided into two sections. The first was based on the quantitative results of the survey and the second on the qualitative results of the focus groups. The second part is still undergoing analysis and we are only able to present a peak of our primary qualitative findings today. So our presentation will focus on the survey results. The survey was carried out over Qualtrics and consisted of two sections that focused on the collection of sociodemographic data as part of COVID-19 case management and vaccine clinics. Our survey results were analyzed using descriptive statistics, whilst the focus groups analysis plan followed a mixed deductive and inductive approach. So to start off with sociodemographic data collection and reasons for not initiating collection. Our survey results showed that 31 public health units collected sociodemographic data as part of their case management activities. The units that did not collect sociodemographic data cited lack of training, resources, capacity, and lack of data analysis guidance as the top reasons for not initiating collection. At the vaccine clinics, we had only 18 public health units who reported collecting sociodemographic data. Some of the reported reasons for not collecting included collection not being a provincial requirement and lack of training as well as capacity. Now onto our time of collection and reasons for early initiation of collection. So um, at case management, we had 24 public health units that began collection um, after the provincial mandate, which happened in June of 2020, and only five public health units started collect collecting sociodemographic data prior to the mandate. Of the 18 public health units that collected sociodemographic data at the vaccine clinics, 15 started collecting sociodemographic data after the province included um, SDD and Covaxon in March of 2021, and three started collecting before um, SDD had been included. The public health units that initiated collection prior to the mandate say that reasons for early initiation included um, measuring disparities in health being a pre-existing organizational priority, community stakeholders requesting sociodemographic data collection, and COVID-19 case disparities being identified in other jurisdictions. So the question is, who did the collection? When did the collection take place? And how it was done? So in case of case uh, management, case manager, case managers were in charge of collecting SDD in all 31 public health units. However, nine health units still also selected other and specified that um, they used virtual assistance. Sometimes the students or provincial workforce staff were in charge of collecting SDD. And when asked about the guidance that public health units gave staff about when to collect data from clients, the answers really varied. So some units opted for collection at the first um, interaction with clients, some at the middle, some at the last, while as others say that it was client dependent and um, also kind of relied on when they were able to establish support with, with their clients. Now, in vaccine clinics, public health units reported that nurses, data clerks, and volunteers were the ones who did the collection. Um, they also reported collecting SDD prior to um, administering the vaccination as part of the nurse assessment or sometimes during the post-vaccination waiting, waiting period. Public health units also reported that collection was done using either Covaxon or electronic surveillance. Now, in terms of completion, monitor, uh, completion monitoring and analysis and dissemination, only eight public health units monitored SDD completion rates during case management, and we found the same number in the case of vaccine clinics. 
When asked about the proportion of clients for whom, for whom so, uh, social demographic data was collected, it is apparent that collection was lower in vaccination clinics when compared to case management. Out of 18 public health units, um, only 16 reported that you know, 0 to 25% of clients submitted their information. Whereas with COVID-19 case management, we had 13 public health units report collection from around 26 to 50% of their clients. So it was very apparent that in case of case management, they had higher completion rates. Now, in terms of sharing results from sociodemographic and uh, from their sociodemographic data analysis, only two of the 18 public health units that collected sociodemographic data in their vaccination clinics reported sharing their findings. Now, after the primary analysis of our focus groups and one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations, we found that participants identified several factors as having a direct enabling effect on their ability to prioritize the collection of sociodemographic data. These identified factors ranged from provincial enablers that included the CCM data management system and mandating um, SDD collection to organizational practices, like, uh, for example, making collection a priority and even building trust during staff and client interactions, the client interactions through providing alternative privacy enhancing response methods, uh, response methods, sorry, and learning from, uh, as well as learning from the community and other jurisdictions. Now, on the other side, uh, our focus groups also gave us a further insight into some of the barriers that impeded the collection of sociodemographic data, some of which had to do with organizational practices. So, for example, lack of support from senior management or having competing priority. Sometimes it had to do with the environment. So, for example, vaccine clinics environment was chaotic and noisy. There were time constraints. Um, sometimes the staff felt um, you know, uncomfortable with collecting private data uh, from clients. And sometimes it had to do with the provincial data systems not being user friendly or maybe difficulties in navigating um, SDG fields within CCM and Covaxon. So to wrap it up, as mentioned before, we are in the final stages of synthesizing our findings, which will be followed by sharing our actionable recommendations. However, we are able to share the following preliminary key messages that include the enablers and challenges with SDG collection. So in terms of enablers, it was clear that mandating uh, sociodemographic data collection acted as a collection booster, as evident in the increase of public health units who initiated collection after the mandate. Public health units also played a role in enabling SDD collection by locally building um, their own collection systems that were user friendly and also by creating their own training material. On the other side, challenges included lack of training and inadequate capacity. So um, I'd just like to highlight that it was noted that despite public health units efforts in terms of developing their own training materials, they often lacked the time and resources needed to train SDD collectors. The recommendations for how this and other challenges will be mitigated will be published in our final report. And before bringing this presentation to an end, I would like to thank our team members who worked laboriously on this project. Special thanks to Dr. Andrew Pinto from the Upstream Lab, Monali Baria from Peel Public Health, and Aydin Reynolds from Ottawa Public Health for leading this work. And now to Q&A with Aydin and Greg. If there are no questions for the speaker, we will move on to the rapid fire presentation um, by Dr. Atia Ken. Uh, so next we have a rapid fire presentation by Dr. Atia Ken from the Faculty of Health at York University. It is on advancing knowledge on health inequities experienced by racialized families with developmental disabilities in the context of the pandemic. Are you able to see my slide? I don't see them yet. 
Okay, so let me just, uh, okay. Are you able to see them now? Yes. Okay. Okay, perfect. I'm not able to see my slide, my slide one. Uh, just a second. I think I'm not able to see my slide. So, uh, so, okay. Okay, that, that's better. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you for having me here. Okay, so my name, hello everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Atiyah Khan. I'm a medical doctor by profession. I'm also a postdoctoral fellow at the Office of the Women's Health Research in Mental Health at York University, Faculty of Health. So uh, my uh, talk for today is on advancing knowledge on health inequities experienced by a racialized found myth with developmental disabilities in the context of the pandemic. And I would like to thank the organizers for the Canadian Alliance for Regional Risk Factors uh, for the symposium for having me here to speak about the current work at our office. So this project is funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council and the principal investigator is Dr. Nazila Khanlu. Uh, for, uh, for who is also my postdoctoral supervisor. So before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the research team uh, who is working on, on a project, the Equity Informed Intersectoral KMB to address pandemic health disparities experienced by racialized families with developmental disabilities. So I'll start off with the um, outline for my talk today. So I'll provide a brief, um, uh, description of the research work that uh, we, the Office of Women's Health Research uh, is doing and completing in the developmental disabilities field and uh, provide some background information of uh, why we needed to do the study and then uh, the aims, the methods, and I'll share some findings from the study and I'll wrap it up with the recommendations. So here uh, you can see a large chart with many um, little boxes. I'll just be minimizing this. I can't see my screen. Okay, I don't know why I can't. Okay, so that's better. Okay, so this slide uh, shows you different little short boxes uh, for where uh, the office began their work in the developmental disabilities field. So this is the program of research. So they started off in 2012, looking at projects on families with youth with developmental disabilities. And then, um, they began to look at some of the challenges of immigrant mothers of children and youth with developmental disabilities, or what they are facing when they're accessing and trying to utilize social services for their children. Uh, then they realized that um, there was also some missing data with regards to health promotion. And um, so the, the office began to look at health promotion, immigrant mothers, and then they realized that uh, there wasn't enough sufficient uh, information about the experiences of racialized mothers who were with children in developmental disability in Canada. Um, then, as you can see, this moves on. So I'm skipping some of those boxes So we are here. And then somewhere over here, when the pandemic hit uh, in the whole world and um, the unprecedented arrival of COVID-19 with over 50,000 COVID deaths in Canada and almost 7 million globally, um, the, the office decided to, you know, uh, go ahead with one of our studies. Um, they wanted to look at the pandemic related challenges for racialized families with children with developmental disability because there just wasn't enough uh, information. And that, that's where um, this study came about. Research has shown that racialized people with developmental disabilities they experience systemic disadvantages across their social determinants of health and interlocking barriers to care. Uh, for those who may not know what uh, development disabilities is, it's a diverse group of chronic conditions comprising mental or physical impairment that arise before adulthood. 
So this is um, a slide that shows what the situation was before the pandemic and what the challenges were during the pandemic. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the 2017 Canadian survey on disability. What the report, the, the report finds that um, those who are aged 15 and over who have a disability, um, about 5.5% 5 .5 of those individuals had a developmental disability in Canada. Um, and you know, people with development disability, they experience uh, exclusion and inequality uh, with regards to um, income, education, employment, even um, social exclusion as well. Uh, so they are not, they excluded in many activities, day-to-day uh, -day activities as well. They also experience um, ex barriers to accessibility, such as attitudinal, uh, which means persons with disability, um, they are, um, you know, they, they report that they're being treated badly or differently because of the different ideas, beliefs, or attitudes that uh, the society or others have about disability. Uh, they also experience physical communication difficulties. Um, about 50% of individuals with a disability experience barriers that limit their ability to move around public buildings and spaces. Um, with regards to communication barriers, persons with disability, um, especially those with uh, uh, some of those with uh, developmental disability experience various communication barriers. Uh, they may not have access to uh, information uh, or, in an ex or information that is accessible in an accessible format. They do not have uh, access to communication technologies. So the report also cites that nearly half or around 45% of Canadians with disabilities encounter barriers in using the information and having getting having access to the communication technologies. So the literature um, speaks about the pandemic related challenges for this um, uh, community, for this population, um, as there was disruption of um, services and supports uh, that these uh, individuals need um, may due to their uh, development disabilities, they could not um, access um, the prevention and response measures that were more accessible to individuals who do not have a disability. Um, as a result, they had uh, exacerbated risks for exposure to COVID-19 uh, and resulting in more complications and death. So we uh, realized, um, and so the more information from uh, pandemic related challenges show that people uh, with this from this, um, uh, clientele, they experienced worse health and also mental health as they, and they were not also able to receive the required health care that they needed. So many, some of them, for example, they were not immunized uh, in time and then they could not get, have access to a nurse or a support worker in their homes. Uh, that's, uh, this is just some of the findings from our previous studies. Um, and we realized that um, there was limited data on people with developmental disability which results in the inability of surveillance systems to uh, accurately uh, determine the impact of the current state. So what was the aim of our project, which was a virtual community workshop? Uh, we wanted to promote uh, knowledge, practice, and research exchange on pandemic health inequities experienced by racialized families with developmental disabilities. We also wanted to create um, an opportunity to network uh, for the families who had youth with development disability uh, and the service providers who are working with around with these uh, clientele and, uh, and the different sectors such as the health and education sector, etc. We also wanted to provide emerging knowledge of how to address pandemic health inequities um, that were experienced by this group of individuals. So what did we do? So this is coming to the methods. We held this virtual community workshop, as I, as I mentioned. Uh, we gathered um, disability advocates, racialized families with developmental disabilities. I mean, the families who had uh, one or even more uh, youth with a developmental disability. And we had service providers, academics, students, and researchers. So this is a big group of people who came together and uh, they were asked to share their uh, thoughts, their views and uh, their own personal experiences uh, or if somebody they knew uh, about the pandemic health inequities. Uh, so what did we achieve at the end of the uh, virtual conference, uh, so workshop, sorry. 
Uh, it helped us to expand our findings from a scoping review on social support for racialized families with developmental disabilities. So I wanted to also let you know that we also shared uh, the findings from our scoping review um, on social support and um, uh, we also gathered some uh, their views on those findings as well. Uh, and on this slide, I'll share uh, the findings from uh, the virtual workshop, um, the, the responses from the participants were themized and we came up with three uh, major themes, healthcare, education, and socioeconomic difficulties for the um, most important according to the, um, the this group of people, individuals. Um, so with regards to healthcare, the uh, participants spoke about the um, language being uh, not inclusive, um, the um, healthcare system lacked the appropriate, uh, it wasn't culturally appropriate, uh, and the care wasn't uh, culturally appropriate, and there was need for anti-oppressive and culturally safe services. Uh, the participants also felt that care was often uh, really uh, rushed. Uh, it, many times it was not uh, accessible. Uh, they did not find the services that were provided very helpful. Uh, they, one another, another thing that was really highlighted was that um, often the um, documentation or the papers they had to fill out were very complicated and, and they felt that they was, sometimes they were, in fact, they were, often they were very excessive. They also felt that um, the services were disrupted and due to that, they, they experienced um, some delays or you know, in, uh, inaccessibility as well. Uh, talking about the education, um, the participants felt that the online um, learning that came about during the COVID-19, uh, they felt the youth were, uh, with developmental disability weren't really supported. There was no uh, support available. Um, adjusting from in-person to online. Uh, they felt that the schools were not really um, equipped to accommodate uh, the, the children with developmental disabilities. Uh, the participants also expressed um, socioeconomic uh, difficulties, facing socioeconomic difficulties. Uh, many spoke about um, having to juggle between uh, providing the care that the child need, needed it in their homes uh, while also trying to work from their home and some of them even mentioned that they uh, had to quit their jobs to take care or at least one of the spouses had to quit their jobs to be able to take care of their child. And this is uh, almost uh, the uh, last slide uh, before I share some other information, a short bit of other information. So in conclusion, uh, we found that racialized families uh, face additional barriers to accessing support and services for developmental disabilities care. Uh, Serving systems therefore need to be more sensitive to the uh, intersections of um, the different identity markers that one holds. For in this case, uh, individuals that have disabilities, they are racialized, and they may they may have um, uh, whatever the gender, or they some of them are even immigrants. Um, so that information needs to be um, you know monitored over time, uh, so that. Uh, we have, it should be more, so that we have more accurate and comprehensive information um, with regards to their experiences in the Canadian society. Uh, the recommendations that emerged from the um, virtual workshop um, highlighted uh, there was in need to increase the support for mental health and social services. Uh, there was also a need to increase the funding, uh, not just um, you know, over and beyond the pandemic. So uh, some of them felt that you know they were they were supported during the pandemic. Others felt that the support was not available during the pandemic, but they felt that uh, funding needs to be increased. Uh, for example, um, many uh, talked about um, funding not being available for respite for the families, like families were exhausted and tired. Um, there was also need to um, increase funding for. Um, reducing the barriers to social determinants of health um, that these racialized families often experience. Uh, care needs to be more culturally relevant. Uh, and also um, they, they mentioned that um, family involvement is sometimes that can, um, families aren't allowed to be involved in the care as much as they would like to. So those barriers need to be removed as well. Uh, so this is a- so sorry, but we've just uh, run over our time here. Okay. Um, but that was fascinating. Thank you so much. 
Uh, we don't have time for questions, but uh, that was a fantastic presentation, Dr. Khan, and we're going to move on to our next rapid oh. fire. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I'll just stop sharing. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And next we have uh, Maria Santiago from the Herbert uh, Wertheim College of Medicine, and she is presenting on racial disparities and overall survival in patients with glioblastoma before and after 2010. Good afternoon, maybe you can? Yes, I can. Thank you. So, good afternoon, my name is Maria, and I'm presenting with Abby Joseph and Christopher Yen. We are medical students from Florida International University, and today we'll be presenting our research based on racial disparities in overall survival in patients with glioblastoma before and after 2010. So why are we interested in glioblastoma? Glioblastomas are considered the most common and fatal malignancy of the brain, accounting for 45.2% of all malignant brain tumors and 16% of all primary brain tumors. Glioblastomas can arise de novo or from astrocytomas, as you can see on the graph. Secondary glioblastomas are derived from grade two or three astrocytoma. Also on this slide, you can see the typical image of a glioblastoma expanding across a cerebral hemisphere showing a butterfly-shaped lesion. Glioblastoma affects mostly adult patients with a mean age of 64 years. It is more common in men than women and in whites as compared to black and Asian Pacific Islanders. The incidence rate is 3.4 out of 100,000. Interestingly, a higher incidence has been found in the Northeast region, although a specific cause has not been found and differences might be due to reporting patterns. So how do we treat glioblastoma? On this slide, you can see the main differences that are used. So before 2010, the main treatments consisted of surgery, radiation, and temozolomide, which is an alkylating agent. And then after 2010, a VEGFR inhibitor, bevacizumab, also known as Avastin, was introduced and is now also regularly used in the treatment of patients with glioblastoma due to its ability to decrease swelling. However, bevacizumab has not significantly increased overall survival, which has remained at a medium of 12 to 14 months. Previous research has shown that cancer survival has been related to race. However, data is conflicting regarding glioblastoma. Although most research suggests that Asian and Pacific Islanders have better overall survival than, than patients of other ethnicities, there's still conflicting information regarding the differences in, in survival between whites, blacks, and Hispanics. Our primary objective is to analyze if the year of diagnosis is a modifying factor in the association between race and three years survival for patients diagnosed with glioblastoma. To our knowledge, this study will be the first to analyze this association by comparing the period from the creation of the SEER database in 1973 to the introduction of bevacizumab in 2010 and from this point to 2018, which is the most recent available data. Okay, so how do we actually do this study? So we use data from the surveillance epidemiology and, and results of the SEER program. This is a program that collects information from around 35% of the United States population. Our participants, as you can see on the graph, um, included patients that were at least 18 years of age diagnosed with primary or in their glioblastoma, and we excluded patients with death upon a non cost on non survival time, patients who were missing information regarding ethnicity or race, and those who were coded as other specified and recurring glioblastoma. The independent variable that we looked at in the study was the race of the patient, and the main outcome variable was the time from diagnosis of glioblastoma to death caused by glioblastoma. And as it was previously mentioned, we looked at the years between 1973 and 2018. We also look at other variables like year of diagnosis, ethnicity, age, gender, floor size, and primary site of surgery, if a surgery was performed. And regarding the analysis that we did, so we performed a descriptive analysis first. This was to preliminary have an understanding of data by assessing the distribution of variables. 
and verified if all the needed information was available. Then we perform a bivariate analysis using chi squared test for categorical variables and a PDF for continuous variables. In addition, we also perform a Kaplan layer curve um, that was used to assess the statistical difference between survival and traces. And we also did unadjusted and adjusted cost regression analysis to calculate hazard ratio. Now to discuss the results. So table one displays the characteristics of our study population of glioblastoma patients from the SEER database from 1975 to 2018. Our overall sample size was 19,407 patients. The data was stratified according to different categories like diagnostic gear, sex, age, if surgery was performed, size of the tumor, and ethnicity. These were analyzed by race, which were white, black, or Asian Pacific Islander. Diagnostic gear, age, size of the tumor, and the ethnicity have significant variations between the races as their p-values were all less than 0 0.001. On the other hand, sex and surgery did not have significant variations between the races. From the table, we can see that white and black patients were mainly diagnosed before 2010, while API were almost evenly diagnosed before and after 2010. We can also see that most patients are older than 45 years old across all ages, races. However, API seems to have the highest percentage of patients diagnosed between 18 to 34 years old, 6.7%, and Black patients have the highest percentage between 35 to 44 years old, which was 10%. So as it relates to tumor size, most tumors were greater than four centimeters across all races, and there was a higher percentage of tumors greater than four centimeters for API patients. This was 25.8%. Ultimately, most patients were non-Hispanic. Nevertheless, most Hispanic patients were white, up to 5.1%, and equally divided between Black and API patients, which was 1.9%. These are the results for Table 2. Table 2 shows the hazard ratio and 95% confidence interval for a three-year cost-specific survival before and after 2010 in glioblastoma patients between 1975 and 2018. White race was our reference. The data was analyzed two times, once including tumor size and once without tumor size, as the results varied slightly. When including tumor size, the hazard ratio was analyzed by race and stratified as either before 2010 or after 2010. The overall unadjusted hazard ratio for Black patients was 0 0.83, 95% confidence interval is 0 0.77 to 0 0.9, and 0 0.86, 0 0.79 to 0 0.94 for API, indicating that Blacks and API had overall greater survival and therefore less risk of dying. When we stratify data before and after 2010, we see that Blacks and API still have greater overall survival than white patients. Without adjusting for tumor size, we obtain similar data. Now, in this figure, we see a kaplan meyer survival curve for patients with glioblastoma according to the three different races that we analyzed. If you look at part A, we're looking at the survival estimate that was significantly different between races when considering diagnostic year before 2010. And we can see that because the p-values was 0 0.001, meaning that at least one of the races had differential survival when compared to the other two. If we look at part B, that represents the survival estimate on 2010 and after 2010. And as we can see on that graph, the difference is no longer significant because the p-value was 0.447. And this means that after 2010, there was no significant difference in overall survival between the patients, but before 2010, there was a difference. In conclusion, our study found that the year of diagnosis does statistically significantly modify the effect between race and three years survival rate. Notably, white while period studies found that API patients had the lowest hazard ratio, our study found that Blacks had the lowest. How several studies suggest that genetics may play a role in the difference of glioblastoma survival between races. Comorbidities that are more common in certain ethnicities may also play an important role. Further research should be conducted to clarify survival rates between races, provide possible biological or social explanations for these disparities, and provide studies post-2010 with higher power or larger sample sizes. These findings can be used to tailor future treatment for all patients and provide insight about prognosis.
So ultimately, we're very thankful for the opportunity to present our research, and we are also thankful to our principal investigator, Dr. Noel Barengo, and our wonderful statistician, Gretel Castro, because they helped us in analyzing the data. And we're also thankful to the SEER database that allowed us to use the data. So if you had any questions for us, we would be glad to answer them. Thank you. My apologies, but I think we have to jump right into our next rapid fire presentation. Thank you so much, Maria, Christopher, and Abby. That was fantastic. And our final rapid fire presentation for the morning is from Subraman Subramanian Karthikeyan uh, uh, from the Population Studies Division of the Environmental Health Science and Research Bureau of, of Health Canada. And uh, they will be presenting on the opportunities for the analysis of chemical exposures in racialized populations in Canada. Uh, are you able to see the screen? Yes, I can. Okay. okay um, yeah, thanks, uh, Catherine, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, I will talk about some of the work we recently conducted using the data collected as part of the Canadian Health Measures Survey. Uh, looking at the opportunities for the assessment of chemical exposures in racialized populations of Canada. Um, as we all know, uh, racial background is a known modifier of chemical exposures uh, for various reasons like uh, uh, varied dietary habits, genetic factors, or socioeconomic status. Um, a systematic exploration of race as a modifier of chemical exposures is, uh, is, is a, a need and a priority in, in the Canadian context. Uh, for a, a couple of uh, key reasons. Uh, one is, uh, you know, as I identified recently, uh, there's a dearth of race-based data in the health sector in Canada. Um, also, we should know that uh, the recent amendment to CEPA, the Canadian Environmental Protection Act uh, amendment, uh, you know, which, which requires that the, uh, the government of Canada conduct, uh, you know, research studies and other activities uh, to ensure the right to healthy environment for all Canadians. Uh, including those who are disproportionately uh, impacted or vulnerable to chemical exposures. Uh, so the work uh, we did, um, or which, which we are currently conducting is looking at, uh, you know, how exactly or, uh, um, you know, how appropriately we can uh, do this type of analysis using the data collected as part of the Canadian Health Measures Survey. Um, as most of you know, uh, should know or may know, uh, the Canadian Health Measures Survey is a cross-sectional survey conducted in two year cycles and uh, led by StatScan uh, in collaboration with the health, you know, I mean, in partnership with Health Canada and Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, it samples approximately 5,000 to 6,000 Canadians across you know, our, uh, people of Canada uh, of ages uh, three to 79 um, per cycle. And uh, over the past six completed cycles of the survey, uh, the CHMS has sampled more than 35,000 people uh, for uh, approximately 250 chemicals. So the key questions that we had as part of this analysis are, is the CHMS sample representative of the racial populations of Canada? Just so that actually we can confidently say that the analysis we do is meaningful. And secondly, um, if we uh, are proceeding with analysis, um, what type of constraints uh, that the CHMS sample may pose uh, for any race-based analysis? Uh, our first question again was, uh, was the CHMS sample, uh, is, the CHMS, is the CHMS sample representative of the Canadian population? Um, we compared the data collected as, far, uh, as part of the, the CHMS cycle four in 2016-17 to the the, 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 the Canadian census data from 2016, uh, the corresponding time frame, And we noticed that uh, the CHMS sample fairly uh, closely aligns with the Canadian census for the proportion of um, uh, visible minorities, um, including a, a number of uh, visible minority racial groups sampled across Canada. Um, I mean, only the exception actually to this would be that uh, the CHMS does not uh, include persons living in the three territories and on reserves and other indigenous settlements. So the, 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 representative, the representativeness of the CHMS for the indigenous populations of Canada, um, you know, is not, uh, is not good. So 
Um, I mean, obviously, actually, the uh, you know the indigenous populations of Canada actually are, are sampled more effectively um, through various focused surveys such as the NCP projects and uh, FNBA, etc. And for the second part of the question, which actually was like, are there any statistical constraints uh, or what type of opportunities that uh, the CHMS provides for racial analysis of chemical exposures? Um, for this purpose, we, you know, obviously we, didn't, we could not go through all the different chemicals. We chose uh, five different chemicals which are currently risk managed by Canada. Um, I will actually give you the example of the lead only uh, for the sake of uh, time. Um, and for the grouping of racial subpopulations, we used the Kai Hai's standard, uh, the minimum, st minimum standard for the race and indigenous identity data collection. Uh, so essentially, we grouped the, the races within CHMS into this uh, uh, eight groups for the purpose of this analysis. Um, one question that we had was um, using CHMS data, are we able to uh, produce uh, um, meaningful estimates? Uh, for example, the averages or the percentiles for various racial populations. Um, indeed, actually, uh, you know, using the current sample size in CHMS, uh, we are able to produce the, the geometric means uh, at the national level, uh, both by age and sex uh, for the, the different racial groups we uh, assessed. Um, in some cases, when you're trying to do the uh, the the, the, uh, the estimates, the, the, such as the, the upper person percentile estimates, like the 95th or the 90th percentile estimates, uh, we may have some difficulties because of the uh, the sample size, which may not allow. Um, with when when the sample size is actually smaller, uh, according to the confidentiality requirements of the Statistics Act, uh, you cannot actually release those estimates. So. When you actually go for the some of the higher percentiles, uh, there is that uh, constraint. Uh, you know, for example, like you may need actually at least hundred participants in a sample to be able to produce a ninety percentile. So, which may not be possible uh, when you for certain racial groups, um, uh, especially when you divide by age or sex. So, this is a constraint. However, when you combine multiple cycles of data from CHMS, that's not an issue. So, again, um, at the single cycle, you may have some constraints. But then actually when you combine multiple cycles of data, that, that constraint is not uh, is no longer there for most racial groups. And we also did uh, some comparisons of the of the racial groups uh, for the concentrations of various chemicals. Uh, we did, we did two, two different types of comparisons. We compared uh, uh, the different racial groups to the uh, to white as a reference group uh, in this particular case. Um, or um, we also attempted a, a, you know, another type of comparison where each racial group was compared to the rest of the Canadian population. Um, in either of those scenarios, uh, when, you, when we actually had a, a single cycle of data, um, you know, we were able to you know, find out, but depending on the chemical, uh, certain types of contrast, for example, like for the lead concentrations here, um, the, the, there was significantly higher concentration of lead actually in the South Asian population compared to the rest of Canada. Um, when you combine multiple cycles of data, you are able to, because of the, the, pop, the, the amount of data available, um, you're able to actually see sometimes actually a, a, um, a, more, a higher number of contrasts, um, but nevertheless, uh, uh, the combining multiple cycles also increases the number of degrees of freedom available to be able to, to, um, to adjust the, the, the regression models for other covariates as well. So essentially, I think it allows for more robust analysis. But the only thing that you need to consider when you combine multiple cycles of data is that actually, you know, are, the, uh, are there any specific trends in the, in the concentrations over the cycles or uh, other method variations that may uh, preclude the possibility or preclude the appropriateness of combining multiple cycles of data. data. Uh, the data from the CHMS also allows uh, the calculation of um, uh, trends uh, in the concentrations for, for various chemicals. Uh, again, actually, they, you know, the, this type of an analysis actually will give us some clues as to if the overall population trends that you see for certain chemicals like lead and cadmium and so on, uh, are they um, also present actually for various population groups uh, by race? Uh, you know, are, are, we, are we seeing any, any, kind of, any kind of disparities in the, in, among the racial populations? Uh, so certainly this, you know, CHMS allows uh, such type of analysis. Uh, overall, um, <clears throat> um, the, some of the work, the, the preliminary work we have done so far shows that the CHMS provides a good representation of the racial populations in Canada. Um, 
that allows us to be able to conduct race-based uh, analysis of uh, uh, chemical exposures. Um, and then the, essentially the sample sizes actually are generally sufficient to produce uh, geometric mean estimates for the races, uh, even by age and sex. Um, however, when, combined, when you're able to combine multiple cycles, um, it increases the sample size to be able to do certain upper percentile estimates, that like the 95% percentiles, percentiles, um, for certain racial groups. Um, it also actually increases the degrees of freedom available to be able to do uh, um, a more robust um, adjustment of various factors in the model. Um, and then the, we can also actually do the trend analysis um, with the type of data available in, in CHMS. Um, so overall, I think the CHMS data, data set provides a very invaluable tool for race assessment of uh, chemical exposures. Uh, in terms of what we, where we're proceeding next, um, we, uh, one of the things we did not do uh, is like for the chemicals we looked at, um, we did not actually uh, do any kind of uh, um, further assessment to see like where the differences come, where the differences among races are coming from. Um, and then we may also actually expand the analysis to more of a screening type of analysis where we can look at the multiple races simultaneously for a large number of chemicals. Um, uh, that's one thing that actually we're considering. Uh, and similarly, like essentially, you know, we also want to be able to associate the, the differences in the chemical exposures to uh, to, and, um, to to health outcomes also based on uh, CHMS or through data linkages. Um, and we also actually hope that as any of the constraints, any of the you know the constraints we find, um, may allow us to identify or further develop uh, methodologies uh, or even actually sampling strategies for the future cycles of CHMS or through targeted samples. Um, focused on specific groups uh, to be able to uh, better assess the racial populations um, of Canada. Thank you. If you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, we have a question here from Kavita. Uh, in future CHMS cycles, are there plans to do further disaggregation by race at the data collection stage? Um, actually, the, uh, the data collection stage, it may be difficult because actually the, the CHMS by its design, uh, it's actually, you know, it's, it, it's limited to be able to do the, you know, do the um, collection, you know, it's actually it's representative, representative for the age and sex only. Um, but however, um, it may be possible depending on, uh, uh, like there may be actually a way, way of uh, um, doing a over sampling of a race or a certain races if they need it, um, and as uh, you know, as the sample permits. Wonderful, and I think we're going to uh, stop our morning session there. Thank you so much, Supermanian. Mm -hmm. That was a fantastic presentation, and thank you to all of our, our keynote presenters and our rapid fire presenters. That was a fascinating morning session. Uh, we do welcome everybody back in one hour, so that's two o'clock p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time uh, for our afternoon session. Thank you so much, everyone. No. Okay, then we will start uh, this afternoon session. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the afternoon session of CAPS 2023 Symposium. My name is Ya Ping Jing. I'm an ophthalmic epidemiological researcher at the University of Toronto. I will be the moderator of the afternoon session. Before we start, I would like to remind you that this session will be recorded. During the presentation, all participants except for the presenter will be muted to avoid interruptions from background noise. We will have one keynote talk and five rapid fire presentations this afternoon. The presentation time will be 50 minutes for the keynote speaker and 10 minutes for rapid fire speakers. If your presentation is over the allotted time, I will interrupt you by reminding you that you are over time. Please wrap up your presentation soon. There will be time for questions and answers after each presentation. So please refrain from your questions until the end of each talk. The question and answer period is 10 minutes for the keynote talk and two minutes for the rapid fire presentations. There are two ways to ask questions. One is to use the raise hand function on Zoom so we can unmute you 
or you can actually unmute yourself and state your questions. The other way is to type your questions in the chat box. We will read your questions to the speaker and the audience. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Carlos King New Orleans. I'm hoping I pronounce your name correctly. Dr. King New Orleans is a dental public health specialist, professor, and vice dean and the director of dentistry at the Western Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry. Dr. King New Orleans' research centers on the politics and the economics of dentistry with a special focus on health and social equity. He is the author of The Politics of Dental Care in Canada, published by Canadian Scholars Press. And he is regularly called upon by government and non-governmental agencies to provide advice on issues of dental care policy. Today, Dr. King New Honors' presentation title is Addressing Inequities in the Social Determinants of Health Through Public Health Surveillance, the Case of Oral Health and Care. Dr. King New Honors, go ahead, please. Thank you, Dr. Jin. So uh, everybody can hear me okay? Just give me a thumbs up. If I don't hear anything, I'll assume that I'm okay. So I'm just gonna share my screen. And we should be good to go. Okay, yeah. so thank you again for inviting me uh, to present um, at at, uh, at your group's uh, presentations. I, I I've uh, never pronounced the whole the the whole name, so I'll say the acronym CARFS. I hope CARFS is okay. Um, I'll begin my presentation by stating that I have no conflicts of interest to declare. Um, I'm not going to go over the learning goals because you should have them in the program. And the learning goals essentially reflect the CARF's uh, uh, goals for, for uh, or objectives for the conference. Um, but I hope to help you understand inequity in oral health and access to dental care and how that affects population oral health in the healthcare system, uh, moving through exploring best practices for data analysis, uh, presentation, and dissemination of results. And this last bit will really be about just giving you, you know, just pay attention to how I'm presenting the information because that has proven successful in, in our efforts to sort of drive change in, in the oral health care system. So where are we today? Well, um, we are on the precipice or we're essentially right at the beginning um, of Canada's largest experiment in dental care policy in, in likely uh, 50 years and some might argue beyond where because of the um, Liberal and NDP um, uh, confidence and supply agreement, uh, the Liberals have uh, have introduced um, uh, the, the Canadian dental care plan. Um, I'm not going to go into details here, but the point is we're going to be spending tens of billions of dollars uh, over the years um, uh, to introduce it, and then about four to five billion dollars thereafter, and ultimately about 9.8 million Canadians are going to be insured um, for dental care when they weren't previously. So a significant, a significant um, uh, policy, uh, uh, policy implementation programmatic investment. So I'll back up here and give you a sense of, 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 um, of what oral health is and, and what it means in terms of uh, uh, diseases and conditions of the mouth. So this is global prevalence of health conditions, and this comes from the World Health Organization. Um, um, and you can see that untreated caries of permanent teeth is ranked as the number one uh, uh, most, uh, uh, you know, most damning uh, chronic health condition in the world uh, in terms of its impacts um, um, and prevalence. Um, and you can find in here at number six, severe chronic periodontitis. Uh, and, and at number 10, untreated caries of deciduous teeth or baby teeth, and then ultimately at 36 in, in terms of total tooth loss. So this is a highly, highly prevalent chronic condition, um, far more than many would expect. And I just want to show you some gross pictures to give you a sense of how significant this health condition can be. This is dental caries or cavities, and when left untreated, can result in significant morbidity and sometimes mortality. Uh, for individuals across the globe, but also in Canada. This is dental caries. Uh, uh, you know, everybody has some mild gingivitis in their mouth. 
but if left untreated personally or through the oral health care system, you can uh, find yourself in this type of situation where you have major periodontal bone loss and uh, essentially a major, major infection in the mouth. Um, uh, and, and this is what you hear about when you think about the oral health systemic health connection. Both of these diseases, which are the two most common and prevalent conditions of humanity, really, uh, lead to edentialism or partial edentialism, meaning having not all your teeth and then ultimately not having any teeth at all. And this influences everything from uh, chewing, speaking, um, uh, digestion. Uh, uh, there's links to cognitive decline, for example. But, you know, at, at, a, at a certain point, you're not going to be able to function effectively in society in terms of uh, uh, getting a job. You know, you're not even going to get a job at a, at a at low wage work if you don't have, um, if you're missing your front teeth, for example. And then, of course, there's oral cavity and oral pharyng and pharyngeal cancer, far less prevalent, but um, you know, not often diagnosed as quickly as we would want it. And, and the five-year mortality rate of these cancers now is at about 50%. Um, it used to be lower, uh, but significant morbidity and again, mortality. So these are the, the general conditions that, and diseases that we would be worrying about with respect to oral health. So how do we spend money uh, in terms of health and dental care in Canada? This information or this data comes from the National Health Expenditure Database uh, held at CAIHI, which we make great use of. And you can see the public and private sector split in terms of health and dental care and you can see that they're almost the complete reverse. And this isn't by accident. At a certain point, we made policy decisions to include physician and hospital care in our national system of health insurance. And we excluded dental care to a very, very large degree. So you can see that type of uh, um, um, split in terms of public and private investments. And if you look at just the, pri uh, the private investments alone, uh, most dental care is paid for through employer-sponsored insurance. So many here are employed by Statistics Canada and by universities. We enjoy these, uh, these non-wage benefits, <laughs> but there are many people who don't, and they pay for dental care out of pocket. So how do we rank uh, uh, across OECD nations? Well, we're, um, in terms of per capita spending for dental care, we rank close to the top among all OECD nations. But in terms of the public share or the percentage of public dental care spending as a, as, as a percentage of total dental care spending, we rank close to the bottom. In fact, this surprises many. We rank behind the United States in terms of our public uh, spending for dental care, our per capita public spending for dental care. And again, now, we're essentially a bit of a laggard internationally, and this is one of the reasons that um, uh, the federal government today has stepped up to sort of close this gap. I also want to highlight that, in general, Canadians actually have excellent oral health. We are actually among the top in terms of oral health status and across, uh, across a variety of clinical measures. But when you look at measures that um, impact the, uh, or that reflect the oral health care system, we don't do as well. So we're, you know, in the mix with Australia, the U.S., uh, the, uh, you know, other private privately oriented oral health care systems in terms of people skipping dental care or checkups because of costs. But if you look at the, the, the inequality in the outcome, um, we actually have one of the widest in the world in terms of percentage point, percentage point differences between those with below average income and above average income. So inequality or differences between income groups in this particular case uh, can be quite large in Canada. So we're here talking about the social determinants of health. So I just wanted to revisit a classic framework in, in, in this area by Solar and Irwin produced for the WHO, WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health. And a lot of the research that, that my research group has done focuses on the health system and on material circumstances. We, of course, focus on education, occupation, and income. And to a certain extent, we've also explored socioeconomic and political context. I also want to highlight that we need to think about, or at least I like to think about uh, um, what we measure on three levels, the average level of health, then health inequality, which is, again, just the mathematical difference between whatever social groups you're comparing. And I know you're very well aware of this. But then there's the issue of inequity, where we're adding um, a moral dimension or a value dimension. And I'll speak to this in a little bit. In general terms, though, when we look at the social determinants of health, uh, um, there are a variety of analytical traditions that address uh, uh, an exploration of the social determinants. And I'm not gonna read you this obviously, but I'm really just wanting to give you a sense 
that, you know, there's the welfare state approach where, or the Esping Anderson approach, which is a very classic approach to comparing welfare states in terms of different health outcomes. I'm sure many of you are aware of this, but to some extent, this falls short in really understanding why uh, or the factors that ultimately drive these inequalities. And then uh, eventually we'll get to inequity. And from my perspective, really, this is about power um, and the power relations between stakeholders. I also want to you to look at this last quote by John Kingdon, who is very famous for his book on understanding policy change, where consensus is built sometimes very rapidly by cutting in many and diverse interests. And that really drove the research program that, that, that I and along with others helped to establish over the last 15 years to, to try and drive change, meaning we try to align stakeholder interests based on the answers or based on the questions we, we help to answer, we try to answer. And to me, I study the political economy of dentistry. To me, this isn't just about the social determinants. It's fundamentally about the political determinants. And there's a classic definition by Dawes, but you can look at a kickbush definition. Health is a political choice and politics is a continuous struggle for power among competing interests. Uh, and then in my book, I just simplify it to a definition that goes like this. Politics is about who gets what and why. So I also want to take a step back and look at CARPS and the meaning of surveillance. I very much agree with CARPS that in Canada, we have a lot of disparate data. And, you know, how do we make use of what is often not great data uh, for public health planning? Um, and, and no difference in oral health and dental care. Data all over the place, not well organized, not well collected. But nonetheless, it is the empirical basis for policy change. So we have to use it regardless of whether we think it's good or not. So I'm going to take you back to my early years of my PhD, where I had several intuitions that essentially helped me build the research program along with students and collaborators. And then I'm going to make a, what I perceive to be a potentially preposterous claim. So let me tell you what my intuitions were. Uh, people love to hear about themselves. Dentists love to hear about themselves. So uh, through historical work and all the research that I subsequently did, um, I wanted to tell them their story. I wanted to feed back the world to them or the world they live in um, uh, to help align interests, as I said before, because again, we are trying to address the social determinants, not just describe them. I fully concentrated myself in answering the questions that stakeholders think are important. And every once in a while, I got to add my own. But really, the problem definitions often were defined by the stakeholders themselves. In fact, my first CIHR grant was essentially pitched as the idea of just answering stakeholder questions. And the other thing is that, you know, a lot of this stuff can be a moral play. So I was interested in just measuring inequality and letting inequity, that moral dimension, that issues of unfairness materialize by sheer force of logic. And I hope to give you a sense of that throughout this presentation. And my preposterous claim is that over a 15 year period, along with my students and collaborators, our research program uh, using existing Canadian data sets uh, helped to successfully argue uh, for change in Canada's oral health care system. I would never make the claim that we are responsible for what is happening today. But if you look at the major policy documents that are being produced today by the federal government, provincial governments, and even some international bodies, you will find our work in there. And that's very satisfying to me. And hopefully we have made some, um, we played some positive role in making change. Okay, before I get to this, I also want to uh, let everybody know that I'm a policy researcher. I am not a health services researcher. I'm definitely no biostatistician. I'm not even an oral epidemiologist but I've been able to form teams that provide the, the, the technical competence that could be added to, to, in one sense, the policy or, or, or programmatic or political competence that, other, that myself and others in my team bring forward, okay? So I just wanna make sure you understand what my position in all of this is, meaning I work with a lot of really talented people. So again, back to the National Health Expenditure Database. This is total dental care expenditure in, ca in Canada per capita from 1926 to 2010 in constant dollars. And this is sort of like the basic framework that we worked on, meaning we started telling Canadian dentists and policymakers the, their story based on this expenditure curve. What was happening in the 30s, in the 40s, 50s, and so on? Why did we get this big bulge in the 70s in terms of um, um, expenditure, Canadian expenditures for dental care? Um, so we told a very, very rich 
a, a policy history in relation to this expenditure curve. We also told every single jurisdiction, province or territory, their same story. This is private dental care expenditure per capita by province. Um, and we literally traced out a policy history for all of these areas. And I'll speak to why that's important later. And we also told uh, governments the exact same thing and, prof and professional stakeholders the exact same thing with respect to public dental care. And we'll explore um, um, the, this curve in a little bit. This is disaggregated, obviously, but we'll, we'll explore it for but Canada in a little bit. So, okay, this is total dental care expenditure in Canada from 1975 to 2021. And it shows you that, for the most part, we spend private dollars on dental care. Again, all of this coming from NHEX uh, and Kaihai. And you can see that most dental care is paid for privately. That's that red line that follows that total blue line. And you can see the effects of COVID-19 at the end. And then you can see how publicly we spend so little, as I said earlier. Now, what's important about this is that it shows there's this tension in Canadian dentistry between public and private dentistry, between public and private roles and public and private responsibilities. And here you can start seeing the issue of inequity arise out of a, a, sheer, a simple descriptive assessment of inequality. So now let's look at public dental care spending. Um, so we're looking at that green curve much in much in much greater detail. Governments did make investments throughout the 60s and 70s, but then there has been a general decline. And in the sociology of, of health, this is, tends to be called government st uh, welfare state retrenchment. But we see a little bit of a kickback uh, into more recent years, and that's because governments have been reinvesting in dental care, and then comes ultimately the huge investments that the federal government is now, is now engaging in. Now, this is work that I'm very, very proud of that helps us understand how the, the public have responded to changes in policy over time. I'm not going to, again, go into much detail into all of the data that I show you, but I want to show you what we could do, for example, with the, the family, uh, um, uh, the survey of family expenditures, uh, and then ultimately its successor, the survey of household spending. Um, this is work that I did with Paul Grutendorf, a colleague of mine at U of T, a pharmaco economist, where we uh, calculated um, angle curves, essentially household budgetary shares for dental care over time. So in 1969, the more money you had, the more you could spend for dental care. And by 1982, that dotted red line, everybody had to take, every Canadian family had to spend less money out of their pocket because they were now either publicly insured because of the significant public investments made in the 60s and 70s, or they were all now privately insured because of the significant, essentially explosion of employer-sponsored health benefits. But over time, lower income households have had to spend more and more and more as governments have tended to shut down public dental care programs while uh, richer households continue to have to spend less. Again, so the issue of inequality, uh, you know, really inequity. How is it that the more you need, the less you get versus the less you need, uh, the more you get? I hope you understand when I say that. But the greatest or the most efficient way we have found to show people the tension between what happens when you don't include dental care in universal health coverage is this. This is from the Canadian Community Health Survey. Uh, the current numbers, uh, uh, I'm sure, remain the same. But essentially, in terms of self-reporting health and oral health, the worse you self-report health, the more frequently you report going to a physician because that's how it's supposed to work in terms of access or, or, or utilization tracking need versus the more you self-report your oral health is poor, the less frequently you report going to the dentist because the system is almost completely privatized. So you fundamentally depend on people's ability to pay or on their um, ability to secure a good job and have a good income. So, the Canadian Health Measure Survey was an opportunity for us to actually get clinical measures. The first time in about 30 years, the last time we collected clinical measures of oral health was in the early 70s through the uh, National Nutrition uh, uh, Health Survey, and we'll revisit that survey later on. But the point is clear gradients, income gradients in terms of decayed teeth and missing teeth, clear gradients in terms of self-reported dental pain and self-reported difficulty eating food. Again, all relatively new information for us as, as, uh, um, as provided by the Canadian Health Measure Survey. And thank goodness we are now about to embark on a new 
In fact, we're already in the field with a new Canadian Health Measure Survey that is collecting oral health data and more. So again, no surprise when we start looking at cost barriers to dental care, again, using CHMS data. People who avoid the dentist and people who declined recommended treatment tend to have more decayed teeth, tend to have more missing teeth, um, um, and, and even more filled teeth, okay? So again, we don't need to go into the details here, but just to give you a sense of the descriptive type of work that we've conducted in this area. Now, if you look at clinically determined needs, this is an area where I wanna highlight the average level of health. Most Canadians don't require any major dental care, 67.2% as per the Canadian Health Measures Survey in 2007 and 9. No major dental care needs. But when you look at the, 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 the distribution of, of, of these needs, you can see that low, low income uh, clearly is related to having a major dental care need, as is not being able to afford dental care in the past. And similarly, uh, uh, if you look at uh, uh, um, those that will require treatment, you are more likely or you will more frequently require uh, treatment if you avoided the dentist because of cost or if you declined recommended treatment because of cost. So again, clear, clear inequality, and hopefully we're now starting to get a sense of the inequity in this system. And ultimately for us, this was an issue of who has dental insurance and who has a good income. So the older you are, the less frequently you report having dental insurance, and the lower your income, the less frequently you report having dental insurance, no surprise. And by the way, this is also CHMS data that was analyzed for our work for the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences report on improving access to oral health care. And again, clear gradients when you start looking at self-reported cost barriers to dental care over time. So this is Canadian Community Health Survey data again, and over time, or at least these three time points, you see that Canadians are with greater frequency reporting cost barriers to dental care. Now, if you track this, the rate of change, I don't, I'm not showing this data today, but if you track the rate of change of these uh, self-reported cost barriers to dental care, the greatest rate of change is actually among low and middle income Canadians, not the lowest incomes and obviously definitely not the highest incomes. And why is that? Well, because if you're middle income or if you're that, that group in the middle, you tend to not have jobs that will give you good benefits coverage um, um, or you are underinsured, meaning the benefits coverage is actually not good at all. Uh, but, you, but you make too much money to be able to uh, access public dental care programs within the provinces and territories. And here you can see that over time, um, we're starting to see a, a signal develop that by 2009, those in the lower, uh, uh, lower middle, middle income groups um, were, the, were the groups that were the least insured in the country. And if we expand this in the context of Ontario, again, still using CCHS data, you can see that over time in Ontario, um, greater frequency of those that are uninsured uh, are reporting these cost barriers to dental care. All right, and I'm having to jump between Canada and Ontario in certain cases because of the incompleteness of the data, and we will discuss that later as well. So why have self-reported cost barriers to dental care uh, increased over time? Well, because private employers, or sorry, private insurers or employers, uh, because the, the insurers really represent uh, the employers, um, they've been paying less and less of the dental bill. You know, in the early 2000s, for a whole host of reasons, which we won't talk about today, uh, private insurance was just paying less and less of the dental bill. Now, I was very lucky to be able to access this data. I haven't been able to access it again from different private agencies, uh, but you know, I'm sure you realize that there is, at least in dentistry, significant data resources available outside of you know traditional public stores. And we have to go after that information in order to be able to tell the full story. And if you look at uh, the Consumer Price Index, again, data from Statistics Canada, you can see that dental care at a certain point started outstripping the growth of all other goods and services in terms of price. So no wonder, excuse me, Canadians have been saying that dental care is becoming less and less affordable over time. In fact, if you look in Ontario, if you, if you exclude tobacco, dental care has had the greatest 
rate of inflation compared to all other items that are included in the consumer price index. So we're really at a, at a crisis point. And in one sense, this is why Canadian governments and specifically the federal government most recently has, has, has felt the need to step in and correct what is essentially a failing market, right? We're no longer efficiently distributing resources, especially if we are trying to distribute resources based on need and not simply demand. Okay, so this has implications not just on individuals, but also on our healthcare system. Back in 2004 or so, as I began my PhD, um, we, we, we and along with others uh, at the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences um, started exploring um, visits to dental, uh, to emergency departments and hospitalizations that resulted from those visits uh, with respect to oral health problems. And what we found is that those age groups that don't tend to have public programs available for them within the provinces, in this case, Ontario, this is Ontario data, by the way. They tend to have to go to the emergency department when they can't access dental care for a whole host of reasons. Um, uh, in terms of neighborhood income quintile, the lowest uh, uh, neighborhood income quintile areas obviously go with more frequency. And then ultimately, you're at an emergency room and you're given a, a painkiller and an antibiotic and you're told to go home because there are no dentists in hospital emergency rooms. And then ultimately, if you do get hospitalized, uh, it's incredibly, incredibly costly. Now, we started looking over time, and by the way, this is all from, from NACRS, or the National Ambulatory Care Reporting System, and the Discharge Abstracts data. This is specifically um, um, it, it, data for Ontario, but you can get this data uh, from Kaihai. It's incomplete, though, across the country, unfortunately, but when you track it over time, you see things like this. Now, there's no denominator on this, so I know I'm breaking a cardinal sin um, with respect to presentation of data, but just take that for what, uh, for what it is. So again, ED visits for non-traumatic dental conditions, essentially all the stuff that should be treated in a dental office. Um, you know, we, we have a problem in the tens of thousands of visits every year. Physicians even worse over time um, in the hundreds of thousands of visits. And again, no denominator on this. So I apologize, the denominator is included in, in the paper. Um, and, and ultimately, most recently, when we did a simple cost calculation, um, again, using NACRS and DAD um, um, for day surgeries, ED visits, hospitalizations, and the like, you know, Ontario uh, is spending about $30 million a year for what is essentially completely inefficient and ineffective care. Um, so, so again, um, I wish I could do this for a cause, or I wish we could do this for every province and, and jurisdiction in the, in the country, but unfortunately we can't uh, because of incomplete data stores, and we'll, and we'll talk about that, of course. And major, major implications for Canadian society in terms of productivity losses. Listen, if you have significant oral disease, you're not going to go to work, uh, let alone uh, be in a capacity to get a job if you're missing front teeth, for example. Um, so again, significant morbidity and oral health issues rank in the context of musculoskeletal sp sprains and strains. Like the most common things where you're going to physician offices um, um, are, are ultimately, you know, in the mix with respect to productivity losses associated with oral health conditions. So a significant economic drain and one that doesn't necessarily need to be there. Okay. So we are making really, really good time. Um, so now I'm gonna show you the research, not that I'm most proud of, but the research that is the most, at least from my perspective, methodologically sophisticated. And again, I wanna give you a sense that I'm not the person to be asking about the, the detailed methods here, but nonetheless, it's really helped us build the case, not just for inequality, but really drive it home in terms of inequity. Um, so if we look at utilization over time, uh, this is age standardized proportion, again, using the CCHS data um, from 1994 to 2014, you can see that we're sort of stable. Um, we're, we're sort of capping out. Um, uh, this is because we're essentially squeezed out as much utilization as we can from the system because everybody who remains out of the system essentially has no money or no insurance to access it. Nonetheless, using a complex measure of inequality, in this particular case, the slope index of inequality or the relative index of inequality, what you actually see is that inequality or differences between income groups in this case have actually been decreasing over time. 
Isn't this interesting? My hypothesis was that we would actually be seeing increases in inequality. So after uh, thinking about this, in one sense, it makes sense because oral health has become so much more than just relief of pain and infection. Now it's about relative inequality uh, or relative deprivation, meaning how do I feel in relation to the people that are around me? So people want orthodontic care. People want straight white teeth because it makes them feel like they're part of society. They're more functional. We A lot of econometric research just shows that the, the more beautiful you are, i.e. straight white teeth and other features, the more people have, will rate you as more intelligent, more capable. Um, we know that if you have good oral health, you end up making more money over time. Um, you know, this is obviously, uh, uh, um, you know, complicated by many, many factors, but nonetheless, uh, uh, the research tends to show this. So very interesting, the fact that inequality has been decreasing over time. But all this means from a policy or a political uh, perspective is that there is a very significant um, electoral uh, desire for wanting to do more around issues of oral health care, i.e. affordability issues with respect to access to dental care. And this is another uh, uh, area that I'm very proud of, like using the concentration index, um, using again the Canadian Health Measures data, everything previously was CCHS data. But you know, I'm not going to go through the details of the concentration index. I'm, I'm sure many people here are aware of how that works. But nonetheless, decay teeth, missing teeth, all concentrate uh, in lower income groups, and I'll just say the poor, whereas something like filled teeth concentrates in the rich because they're the ones that can actually go to the dentist, right? So this is where we really start seeing what I would call high impact information. Why is it that uh, uh, obesity doesn't concentrate in the poor as much as decay teeth? Or why is it that high blood pressure doesn't concentrate in the poor as much as missing teeth? Well, uh, there's a much greater magnitude of concentration of oral health-related outcomes in, in lower income groups because of the nature of our oral health care system, or at least that's the claim, all right? Because if you're obese or if you have high blood pressure or at risk for those things, you get to go to the physician uh, uh, to get um, either treatment or information to help you improve your health, okay? But you don't have that luxury when it comes to decayed and missing teeth because you're shut out of the system. And in fact, when you decompose the concentration index or, or, or this estimate of total inequality, you can see, let's just concentrate on decayed teeth. You can see that access, that inequality in access to oral health care explains the greatest percentage of total inequality in that outcome. Again, decayed teeth, socioeconomic status, essentially income and education. Inequality in that outcome in socioeconomic status has a significant explanatory power in relation to inequality in decayed teeth. And you see oral health behaviors like brushing and flossing your teeth only explain, or inequality in that, only explain about 11% of total inequality in decayed teeth. The reason this is so powerful is because dental groups, dental hygiene groups, um, even, even nutrition uh, or um, dietitian groups um, have tended to tell governments, and governments have believed it, that all we need to do is get people to brush and floss their teeth more and everything and eat better and everything's going to be fine. Well, this just shows you that it's not that simple. We can't be victim blamers. We have to concentrate on more upstream factors, like, i.e. the social and political determinants of oral health. Because if you really did want to reduce inequality in decay teeth, for example, you would likely find your greatest answer in things like access to oral health care or improving social and economic conditions. So again, this is a very, very powerful slide to me, to me and has allowed me to make very significant strat or inroads with policymakers of all kinds. Um, and again, uh, data from the CHMS, and we're gonna be able to compare it with the new data in the CHMS, which should be available to us in about four to five years. And we've done some descriptive work 
to look at the impacts of, of, um, of provincial public dental care programs and territorial public dental care programs. And it's never a real clean signal, but this is again, just qualitative assessment of, of, of this graph. Um, but this is the odds of not visiting a dentist uh, among Canadians uh, 12 to 17 years old, uh, um, shown in relation to provinces that have adolescent programs and provinces that don't. So provinces like Manitoba, Alberta, BC, New Brunswick, they don't tend to have public dental care programs or at least province-wide programs for adolescents. And what you see is a general trend towards um, if you have poor oral health, not going to the dentist in those jurisdictions. Now, I'm not going to show you the rest, but we've done this for adults. We've done this with seniors. And you tend to see the same general um, 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 outcome that in those provinces that have robust public dental care programs or invest more on a per capita basis for public dental care, you tend to see lesser rates of not going to the dentist. Um, if you have poor oral health. This was a marginal effects analysis for, uh, for dental insurance uh, and its effects on yearly dental visits and only visiting for emergencies in Ontario, uh, uh, again, using the CCHS. And again, you don't need to look at the, the figures in any detail or the tax table in any detail, but what you'll see is that um, in terms of the marginal difference, uh, the greatest impact would be seen among lower income groups. So one could imagine a world where if you provided dental insurance to the population, you'd get more dental care utilization among the lowest income groups, at least for some time because of, of a pent up need or pent up demand. But what's really important about this is that it achieves the principle of uh, proportionate universalism, which is a very popular thing in equity studies of health. Meaning, like in a, in a universal healthcare system, if you give the intervention to everybody, i.e. Uh, remove the, um, the affordability bear, then the people who need the most care will use it the most. Um, we've also been able to look use the CCHS to look at the connection between self-reported oral health outcomes and chronic disease outcomes. And you can see here that you are at a greater odds of experiencing a variety of chronic conditions. Again, all self-reported information um, if you self-report your oral health is poor. Um, and the signal becomes much more precise once you're past age 60. So what we're what we what we know is that poor oral health isn't going to erode your health in a span of a year or a span of five to ten years. It takes a lifetime. But by the time you're older and you've experienced poor oral health for 30, 40, 50 years, you really are at risk. Now, I'm not going to get into the pathobiology. There's a lot of people that actually think that this is too too complicated by uh, uh, by uh, socioeconomic status, et cetera. Um, nonetheless, when you do the work to try and tease out the signal as best you can, you still see these things. And now we're starting to get more of a greater biological understanding of why something like this might be. Um, I'm very proud of this. This is work where we use the Canadian Community Health Survey and linked it to administrative data in Ontario um, to create a retrospective cohort to look at diabetics in this case and whether those diabetics that had poor oral health um, and tended to have worse diabetic outcomes than those diabetics with good oral health. Now, the reason we chose diabetes is because the strongest evidence of a bi-directional link between oral health and a health condition is in diabetes. And what you see here is that after adjusting for every possible thing that we could, that we could adjust for, um, you're at a higher likelihood of having a chronic uh, diabetic outcome um, if you if you were a diabetic with poor oral health compared to a diabetic with good oral health. And these are not minor issues, myocardial infarction, stroke, foot ulcers, limb amputations, kidney failure, dialysis, retinopathy. So this is not nice, nice stuff. Um, this is the latest. Uh, again, we link CCHS data over time, uh, cross-sectional uh, 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 waves of it to, uh, to administrative data, health administrative data. And we were looking here of the relationship with chronic, uh, with heart disease uh, and cardiovascular outcomes, because that's another place where the data uh, or where the data on causality is strong. Essentially, the story here is that the worse you rate your, your oral health, the greater um, um, the incidence of you experiencing at least ischemic heart disease and stroke, or depending on the measure, things like coronary heart disease and stroke. 
Now, what is most interesting, and this is where really I am nowhere, nowhere to be found in terms of the analytical component, uh, I had a student work with, uh, with individuals at the Dalana School of Public Health using a competing risk, competing risk analysis here, competing death. And what was most interesting is, yes, poor oral health, however you want to measure it, self-rated oral health, uh, uh, self-reported inability to chew, will result in a greater uh, uh, incidence of, of, uh, of whatever outcome you're looking at um, um, if, you, if you have poor oral health compared to if you have good oral health. But what's most interesting is that poor oral health is actually much greater at, 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 at predicting, um, if I could use that term, uh, competing death, meaning you are going to die for, from all causes at a much greater rate than you are for any cardiovascular disease outcome, for example. So what this tells you is that it's not that poor oral health can be conceived of as a risk factor. You can do that, and there's people trying to figure that out. But we should be thinking about poor oral health as a risk indicator, as something that physicians, for example, can pay attention to if they're interested in averting uh, premature death, for example. I'm almost done here, so we're making good time. Um, we've also been able to use uh, uh, CHMS data and Nutrition uh, Canada survey data from the early 1970s to compare with other countries. Here I'm just showing you comparisons between Canada and the U.S. over time. And this is the issue of monitoring inequality. And don't worry about the details here, but the story is that in... In absolute terms, things have gotten better in Canada, meaning there's less oral disease across the population. But relative differences in that experience of oral disease have actually gotten worse. Um, and there's a lot of detail here, and it's all hypothesis testing or hypothesis uh, generation. It's not hypothesis testing work. But nonetheless, what's interesting about this is that things tend to still be worse in the United States, even though they fund more public dental care. So what this tells you is that it's not just about access to dental care. Um, that's a big portion of it, but there's a whole bunch of other social and living condition issues that we need to consider if we really are interested in not just improving the average level of oral health, the average level of access to dental care, but reducing inequality, or I hope by this point, I can say inequity in these outcomes. Um, I'm going to leave, uh, I'm not gonna discuss this because I think I've really made my point. So what's my take home message? Well, I've shown you a lot of stuff uh, that looks great, but the reality is that we really struggle in even uh, having the same measure over time in the Canadian Community Health Survey, um, meaning there's poor quality oral health related data in Canada, whether at the national level, at the provincial level, and almost nothing at the municipal level. Sure, there's here, there's stuff here and there, but nothing that can be uh, compared uh, in one point in time or over a period of time. The thing is, though, I want to stress that you can still make lemons out of you can still make lemonade out of lemons, and and hopefully we've been able to do that. What's really important today, though, is that the current federal oral health investment provides us a significant opportunity to create a new and strong data infrastructure for oral health, one that spans the public and private sphere. The other stuff that I haven't shown you today, and I could speak to you for a whole day, obviously, about this, is that there's a lot of primary data collection occurring in this research program over time. There's a lot of other quantitative and qualitative research that is brought all together to tell a story, right? Um, and it's not a moral play. It's just these are the facts, at least as we see them, or at least as we may be able to tease them out. And it's about letting policymakers uh, decide whether there is, in fact, inequity. But you can really drive that perspective in the context of addressing the social determinants of health. And you can drive that perspective with good data and good analysis and good communication of that data. Surprisingly, though, the best way to communicate, I have found, is the simple descriptive information, not necessarily the, 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 the more statistically complex uh, uh, presentation of findings. So I want you to ultimately think of survey as surveillance as action research. You know, we wake up in the morning and we do a lot of good work, but we want to do it in the service of others so that we can have a, a stronger and better Canada. So thank you very much. Thank you very much um, for a very interesting presentation. Now it's uh, time for questions and answers. Once again, you can ask questions in two ways. One is the user raise hand function on Zoom. 
Another is typing your questions in the chat box and uh, we will read your questions to the speaker and the audience. Currently, I found there is one question in the chat box. The question is, it appears that income by way of employment is the driving force for dental care in Canada today. Do other determinants such as race, ethnicity matter? They do matter. They do matter, Fun, uh, not funnily enough, but interestingly enough, uh, a gender, at least measured as sex, tends to matter, meaning uh, um, men tend to have worse oral health. Ethnicity also matters, uh, really, but this is related to immigration status or refugee status. We've actually done some work that shows <clears throat> that they're using the uh, survey of uh, uh, the longitudinal survey of immigrants to Canada. We've actually shown that the uh, healthy immigrant effect is at play, meaning people tend to come with good oral health, but then that oral health can decay over time, no pun intended, um, based on all of a sudden not being able to access care. So yes, a lot of other stuff plays a role. Even things like fear or phobia plays a role. But I wanna make sure everybody understands that ultimately, if you look at the math, income and insurance status Will, will will far outweigh any other any other effect. Um, but nonetheless, it does not mean we can we can ignore these other things because public policy or programmatic intervention needs to be tailored to the people it is it is it is trying to serve. So it's just not as simple as removing the affordability barrier. But nonetheless, uh, uh, if you do that, you you get a long way. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? I'm seeing something here by Catherine McMillan in the in the chat. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Catherine, yeah. When I was involved in rolling up the Ontario Seniors Dental Care Program in Ontario, one population that was excluded were beneficiaries of the, of the non-insured health benefits program for Indigenous and Inuit populations. What is your opinion of the NIHB program and its inclusion of dental care? Is it creating more harm than good? So really, really interesting question. And I will say this, um, having done a lot of research in this area as well, especially during my master's, um, that the non-insured health benefits program is actually the most robust dental care program in this country. And it far out spends any other public dental care program. In fact, when you add up all federal expenditure, it's about uh, federal dental care or even uh, uh, Canada-wide public dental care expenditure, it's about two-fifths of those expenditure for a, for a small portion of the population. And many would argue rightly so, right? We have a very specific relationship with Indigenous populations. It covers more services, pays the best generally, not always, but it tends to pay the best. And these are things that uh, the dental profession cares very much about. Where I think it causes problems though, is that it confuses issues around what should be covered, right? Uh, it, it tends to cover so much that other public health programs feel that they need to be like the NIHB, uh, um, even though everybody tends to dislike the NIHB program. So we start covering services where there's not a lot of good evidence of therapeutic benefit for the population. And to me, that's just money wasted. The other thing that it complicates is the general federal, I would argue, approach to wanting to deal with this issue because there's always has to deal with this unique state indigenous relationship. Um, um, I'm not gonna get into those politics per se, but it unfortunately muddies the water and it doesn't have to, but it unfortunately muddies the water from a policy and, and political dynamic as we try to solve the issue of inequity and in access to oral health care and inequity in oral health. Thank you. Any question or even comments? So if not, I just ask a naive question. I heard of this uh, dental care program for children and seniors in Ontario. Is that uh, only the program for Ontario and all other pro Canadian provinces have the similar programs? So there's a variety of public dental care programs in Ontario. The two biggest ones that you're highlighting are on uh, the Healthy Smiles Ontario and the Ontario Disability Support Program. Uh, sorry, the uh, um, Ontario Seniors Dental Care Program. 
But there's also a major program for people with disabilities called the Ontario Disability Support Program, and another major program for people on social assistance called Ontario Works. In general, in every other jurisdiction in this country, they all tend to have similar type programs. Quebec is unique. Prince Edward Island and Newfoundland is unique, but not unique enough that I wouldn't say that they're all variations on the same theme. Okay. Thank you. If no more questions seems so then we save some time. We go ahead. We will move on to the next presentation given by, by Karen from New Brunswick Health Council. The title of the presentation is Mercian Population Health in New Brunswick. Karen, go ahead. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear and we can see well. Perfect, thank you. Um, well, my name is Karen Leblanc Gagnon. I'm an information analyst here at the New Brunswick Health Council. I'll be talking to you about some tools we've created to help measure, monitor, and inform on population health in New Brunswick. Um, first, the agenda. So basically, who's the New Brunswick Health Council? And what are some of the toolkits we're trying to create here to measure population health? And I'll give you a brief uh, tour of our website. So first, the New Brunswick Health Council is a provincial crown corporation that has a dual mandate. So the first one is public reporting on the health system performance. This includes population health reporting to ensure the services meet the population's current need. The second one is engaging citizens in the improvement of health services quality. The current structure of the council is 12 council members and we're 17 staff. At the NBHC, we have designed a variety of tools to help develop a shared understanding of the unique realities of each communities and health zones in New Brunswick. On our websites that I'll be showing you at the end, you can find a few complementary ways to understand population health uh, in our communities. This is the model we use at the Health Council to measure, monitor, and inform New Brunswickers on population health in combination with demographic context. This model regroups determinants of health that can be influenced by programs and policies. The determinants of health have been grouped to show their general influence on the health outcomes. Health outcomes are ultimately measuring how long and how well we live. This model has been adapted from the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute, Wisconsin County Health Rankings model. It was chosen after reviewing many frameworks and literature review on the de determinants of health. It's a model that's not the having a good approach to health reporting. It makes it easy to understand the concept of the determinants of health and can help identify priority issues for, <laughs> sorry, for action. The Health Council has been using this model for quite a number of years. We realized very quickly that this model was a catalyst to be able to have a wider reach to population health information, a stronger user base from various government entities and non-government entities, as well as a general understanding from citizens. The New Brunswick Health Council information is available for the province, the health zones, and the NBHC community boundaries. On the map, you can see the dark purple lines representing the seven health zones in New Brunswick and the light gray lines, which are the 33 New Brunswick Health Council communities. These community boundaries are based on the catchment areas of healthcare service establishments. These communities vary from roughly 7,000 people to up to 90,000 people. tools and their data. So we produce population health profiles, which are an agglomeration of over 400 indicators from various sources organized by the population health model and where feasible available by age, communities, health zone, and at the provincial level. We also produce a shorter version we call a snapshot, which are roughly 50 indicators. It provides an information on improvements over time and helps us understand the global picture of how New Brunswick, New Brunswick situates itself in relationship to other provinces in Canada. For each of these, we use administrative data, such as information from vital stats, the discharged abstract database, and a variety of other government entities' databases. We use census data in a variety of surveys, some of which we manage in-house, such as a student wellness survey that we administer in all schools in New Brunswick from 
kindergarten to grade 12 every year. We also do uh, surveys on primary care, on primary care services, home care services, and hospital acute care services. The second part of this population health toolkit for New Brunswick are the observation and infographics. We understand not everybody might have the time or expertise required to look at all 400 indicators for specific geography. So the observations, you can see an example of an image on the left, are produced to help understand these pieces of information and put them together to show the picture at one point in time. These observations are an analysis of our population health indicators to help better understand how healthy we are today and what are some of the factors that influence our health. Our infographics, here's an example on the right, are topic specific that help provide a very quick preview of the situation in New Brunswick. Together with the data, these tools provide the base for understanding population health in New Brunswick. Now I'd like to give you a quick tour of our website just so you can get a good perspective of what I'm talking about. So this is our website. Um, some of the surveys we administer can be found here. Do you still see the presentation? The way? I'm assuming you do. Yep. Yes, so we can see. Perfect. Um, so under the data element, uh, you can find all our data elements by a variety of different geographies, as I mentioned. The, you can go straight to the population health or to the snapshot directly. Since I mentioned we have all our population health available by communities, that's where I'll be showing you some of our information. Uh, you can select the geography you want specifically. I'll show you Moncton because I'm talking to you from Moncton today, Moncton, New Brunswick. When you're on the Moncton page, there's a few things that you can see. So first you have all the data. So this is all the data we have available from for the community of Moncton, New Brunswick. So the population health data tables can be seen here, as well as all the internal surveys we manage, that information can also be seen here. The publications I mentioned can be seen here. And uh, if you really want to know all the small municipalities or areas around Moncton, what's included, that's where you could find this. Let's go to uh, health outcomes just to, so you get a broader picture of some of the elements we have. So automatically when we load up uh, the data, the Moncton community comes up as well as the health zone it's situated in and the province. And we can also compare some other geographies. For this one, it talks about quality of life and length of life. So if we go by quality of life, we have it separated by uh, age groups, as I mentioned. So infant, children, so health outcomes specific for children, youth, adults, seniors. Uh, we have other elements as well. Uh, here, if, I'm just going to show you prevalence of chronic health conditions in adults and seniors. So here, one of the surveys we do uh, is um, we ask, uh, it's, we call it our primary care survey, and we use it, think of it as a CCHS, except more in detail and specifically for New Brunswick. So we can look at uh, an indicator that we call diagnosed or treated for three or more of the 12 first chronic conditions in the questionnaire. And if you're thinking, well, what, what is that questionnaire about? You can go and see all the uh, chronic diseases we're talking about. Um, we're trying to be able to uh, show information uh, with as many uh, cuts as possible. So the geography cuts are what you can see here, but you also have access to this information to see if there's differences, let's say in language. So for those who have a preferred language of service of English or French, is there a differences in citizens who have three or more chronic illness in indigenous identity? Um, you can see education level, et cetera. So we have these cuts available at the provincial level. As I mentioned, we're trying to um, always improve on the visualization of our tools. So new to us, we are showing, we're just graphing automatically because we were having lots of people just download the CSV and trying to do their own graphs. So here it's just more of a quick capture so they can see where their community is compared to the others. 
it automatically maps every single indicator as well. So uh, this was uh, citizens who reported they have been diagnosed or treated for three or more uh, chronic conditions. So the lighter number is, is a lower number. So it means uh, less people have been diagnosed and the darker color means more people. So you can easily see was there a difference between 2011 to 2020. So you can see the whole map got a whole lot darker. That means more people are being diagnosed with three or more chronic conditions, which can, which can ultimately have a very uh, a big impact on your health outcome and some of the health services that, uh, that you use. Uh, I wanted to share this type of information. This is what we've been doing at the Health Council. And uh, thank you very much for your, uh, to listening to me. Thank you very much, Karen. Very nice. Nine minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? Questions or comments to Karen? And uh, if not, I ask one question to um, Karen. The web the website that you showed is shows very comprehensive information. It's very useful. But I'm just wondering. Who will be the targeted users of the website information? Is mostly for public health professional or academic researchers? Um, it uh, it's we is because you you saw it has a very wide reaching. So we're really trying to aim, you know, to make sure citizens are aware of the information, but not all citizens will get to go on our website. Uh, we have lots of academic folks using it. Uh, lots of. Uh, government folks so either within uh, healthcare or education or social development they've been using it quite a bit uh, mostly um, uh, when it comes to do that policy writing our information is the base for some of the policies in new brunswick we're also finding uh, non not-for-profit organizations in new brunswick are some uh, high users because they tend to uh, apply for grants in their areas so um, they're trying to show why they would be the one receiving the money. Uh, recently, just as recently as this morning, in a few New Brunswick papers, we've been cited with different elements of our data, right, in different articles about stuff that's happening. So we are spending time with a, a wide sphere of folks just to um, make sure everyone understand. And we're just trying to make it as uh, easily accessible as possible. But as uh, thinking that, uh, you know, folks who do want to see confidence interval or that kind of stuff, we, uh, we can provide it as well. Okay, thank you. Now more questions come to me. <clears throat> One question is, uh, how long did it take to plan and launch your dashboard? Um, well, we've been doing, we were created in 2008 and we were doing everything in a PDF format until roughly 2020. It took us about, uh, let's say a year to plan and launch the dashboard elements of it and to make sure that it's uh, equipped with all the data. Uh, we didn't really have a choice because we were finding a, in the data world, sometimes with all the data elements we have, uh, we were at times uh, making small errors, not, you know, by anyone's fault, but errors would happen and to always go back in all the PDFs and having to uh, fix these errors was not an effective way or even to extract data from some of our partners. So I'd say probably about a year to have it all uh, up to date. Uh, but uh, I say that it, it's a constant evolution right? Like we were, the maps and uh, the charts have just been added last year, or yeah, not even. Okay, and uh, thank you. The next question, um, do you have any nutrition data on your dashboard? And if you do, what is your data source? Uh, we have data regarding uh, kids nutrition. who go to school, uh, uh, basically, so kindergarten to grade five and grade six and 12. Uh, it's from surveys that we ask them about uh, their eating habits. So I wouldn't say necessarily nutrition, but more about their eating habits. So uh, if they eat breakfast every morning, if they eat to a fast food place three times or more in a week, uh, if they sit down and eat with their family or friends for supper, uh, that's the type of information we have for those age groups. Uh, also, we've added if they eat a processed food, so that could be 
you know, the closest to nutrition we have or, you know, uh, fruits and vegetables as well. Uh, we have information for adults and seniors from our primary care survey. And it's uh, very basic to the, you know, how many fruits and vegetables do you eat? So that's, that's a more all on those eating habits and might, maybe not nutrition, but uh, that's the closest we have. Okay. The next question, how do you measure the usefulness of the dashboard with your stakeholders? Ah, oh, that's a big question. <laughs> uh, well, we, we go at it through a few different ways. So one of them is obviously we look at the analytics of our website and we see what pages, what indicators, how, you know, how those elements are being used. And is it a very, uh, do people just show up and click and walk away or do they, you know, how long do they spend on it? Um, we also measure it through uh, doing presentations, through networks that we know would be high users of information So in New Brunswick. So just to make sure that they're aware that it's there and um, we're uh, very open to uh, answer any and all questions that they have. So that's more on that informal front. But uh, New Brunswick uh, is a very small province. So you easily get to know who all the right players are. So that's how we're trying to uh, pass the word out. The next question, how often is the data on the dashboard updated? Um, as often as uh, we have data inputs. So last month, we released the students wellness survey information that we uh, were in school in November, December. So we released it last month. Uh, this Wednesday, we're releasing up to date information on our primary care survey that we did last fall as well. Uh, so it's a very uh, uh, dynamic uh, dashboard. Okay, thank you very much, Karen, for a wonderful presentation. Thank now you. Now we move on to the next presentation given by Kiko from the Institute of Medical Science, at University of Toronto. Kiko's presentation title is Unequal Access to Routine Eye Examinations in Canada A Systematic Review of Government Funded Coverage Policy. Kiko, go ahead, please. Hello, can you see my, my yes, slides? Yes, we can see your slides and we can hear you. Go okay. ahead. Perfect. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Kiko and I'll be presenting my research titled Unequal Access to Routine Eye Exams in Canada, a Systematic Review of Government-Funded Coverage Policy. In this presentation, I aim to delve into the availability of routine eye exams and the impact of disparities in government coverage policies on the vision health of Canadians. On this slide, you'll also see all the individuals who helped me put this research together, and I just want to give them a quick thanks. All right, so to start with some background, routine eye exams play a crucial role in identifying undiagnosed eye diseases and ensuring timely corrective measures. This is significant when we consider that many ailments of the eye are asymptomatic until irreversible damage and vision loss have already occurred. In Canada, medically necessary hospital and physician services are covered by the government under the Canada Health Act. However, eye exams are not considered medically necessary services. Rather, they're considered additional benefits and thus government coverage are at the discretion of each province. Given the importance of eye exams, the Canadian Association of Optometrists recommends the following schedules to maintain vision health. For school-aged children, a comprehensive eye exam every year is recommended until the age of 19. For adults aged 20 to 64, it is recommended to have a comprehensive eye exam at least once every two years. For older adults aged 65 and above who are at a higher risk of age-related vision changes and conditions, it is recommended that they have an eye exam at least once a year. So now that we know what routine eye exams are and the recommended frequencies, let's look at the purpose of our study. In our study, we aim to answer two questions. First, do Canadians have equal access to government-funded routine eye exams? And second, does it matter if Canadians do not have equal access? Thus, the goals of our study are twofold. First, we aim to determine if Canadians have equal access. And secondly, we aim to compare the vision health status between Canadians with and without government-funded routine eye exams. 
To answer our first question regarding equal access, we systematically reviewed government coverage policies on routine eye exams for healthy individuals in 10 Canadian provinces. Here we focus on healthy individuals because individuals with a diagnosed eye disease are covered for government funded exams under the Canada Health Act. To answer our second question, we systematically reviewed relevant publications from PubMed focusing on vision health status comparisons between individuals with and without government funded exams. Now, moving on to the results of our study, relating to our first question, we found that for seniors in Canada aged 65 and above, six provinces provide government funded routine eye exams. Among these, four provinces offer annual coverage, while two provinces provide exams once every two years. Now you'll see that Ontario has an asterisk next to it because as of September 1st, people in this age group will only be covered for one eye exam every 18 months instead of 12. Additionally, we found that four provinces do not cover any eye exams for seniors. These four provinces are Newfoundland and Labrador, PEI, New Brunswick, and Saskatchewan. Remarkably, when the cost of eye exams are not covered by the government, they can cost anywhere between $100 to $200, according to the Canadian Association of Optometrists. Considering that the median after-tax annual income of seniors in these four provinces is approximately $26,000, which is $6,000 less than the nationwide average, we have to ask ourselves, is it truly fair that these seniors have to pay out of pocket? Moreover, in these four provinces, 18.3% of seniors have an after-tax income that lies below the low income measure. So it becomes more and more clear that affording routine eye exams may be an issue for seniors when they are uncovered. Moving on to Canadians under the age of 20, we found that five provinces offer annual coverage, while two provinces provide exams biennially. However, if you take a closer look, you'll notice that Nova Scotia only covers until the age of nine, whereas Manitoba covers to the age of 18. Lastly, three prov provinces provide no coverage for eye exams. So we can conclude that children are not covered equally despite the fact that regular examination helps detect and address any vision issues that may be impacting their learning and overall well-being. Now for our final age group, our study reveals that for Canadians aged 20 to 64, there are no government funded routine eye exams in any of the 10 provinces. Now to look at results relating to our second study question, in one study, which looked at the incidence of self-reported glaucoma, cataracts, and vision loss, it was found that the incidence of glaucoma was lower in uninsured provinces than in insured provinces, a starking 8.1 versus 12.8. The reduced self-reported incidence of glaucoma was likely due to reduced detection of these diseases. In other words, individuals simply did not know if they had glaucoma because they did not go to get their eyes checked. Similarly, the incidence of self-reported cataracts was also lower in the uninsured versus the insured provinces. However, the incidence of vision loss was higher in the uninsured provinces. The increased incidence of self-reported vision loss was likely due to poorer access to eye care, late diagnosis, and late treatment of these blinding eye diseases, which resulted in poorer vision health outcomes. Following this pattern, another study found that the prevalence of non-refractive vision problems was higher in provinces with uninsured eye exams, with 8.5% of individuals compared to 6.4%. Other studies which look directly at the effects of delisting show similar results as well. For example, in this one study by Kiran, Ontarians were studied before and after delisting of routine eye exams in 2004. Prior to 2004, all Ontarians, irrespective of age, were covered by government for routine eye exams. After 2004, however, Ontarians aged 20 to 64 were required to pay out of pocket, which provides us a natural experiment to determine the role of government funded exams. So despite the fact that Ontarians with diabetes remained covered after delisting in 2004, there was an 8.7% decrease in eye exams among individuals with diabetes. There was also a decrease in the administration of ophthalmologic exams. From these results, it was determined that the delisting of routine eye examinations for healthy adults in Ontario had the unintended consequence of reducing publicly funded retinopathy screening for people with diabetes. Another unintended consequence of delisting routine eye exams in Ontario was a decrease in new glaucoma diagnoses. It was found that after delisting, new glaucoma diagnoses were reduced in all age groups. 
Similarly, when the UK delisted eye exams in 1989, new patient referrals to the Bristol Eye Hospital were 13.7 to 19% less than expected. From these two studies, we can see how the introduction of fee-for-service models similarly affects two different geographic locations. We see reduced administration of eye exams and thus reduced detection of blinding eye conditions. Lastly, it has been shown that the costs associated with routine eye exams contribute to reduced utilization of eye care providers. In one study, which looked at the utilization of eye care providers by Canadian adolescents, it was found that the utilization rate was highest in provinces with insured eye examinations and almost 10% lower in provinces without. In another study, which looked at the acceptance of diabetic retinopathy screening, it was found that when screening was free, 94.7% of participants accepted. However, when there is a spot co-payment fee of just eight USD associated with screening, acceptance drops to 91.2%. And from these findings, it can be determined that lack of government funding and cost provides a significant barrier for individuals in accessing necessary eye care. So these findings lead us to our conclusions and implications. Canada is very proud of their universal healthcare system and claims that they are committed to providing equal care. However, our results highlight the glaring disparities within the Canadian healthcare system when it comes to providing equal access to government-funded routine eye exams. First and foremost, the study reveals that access to government-funded exams in Canada is heavily influenced by geographic location and age. This disparity in coverage creates an inequitable system where certain provinces provide comprehensive coverage, while others offer offer limited or no coverage at all. Secondly, the study demonstrates that a lack of government-funded exams as the result of delisting is associated with reduced detection of blinding diseases and a reduced utilization of eye care services. In light of these conditions, several implications arise. Firstly, there is a pressing need for policy change to ensure equal access for all Canadians, irregardless of age or geographic location. And furthermore, additional research is needed to explore the short-term and long-term costs associated with government coverage of routine eye exams. A cost-effective analysis could help us guide policy in the future. And that brings us to the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Kiko. Any questions? or comments to Kiko. Question is, once again, you can ask questions by using the raise hand function or unmute yourself. The other is type your questions in the into the chat box. Okay, it seems I didn't see, I didn't say any questions. If not, then we will move on to the next presentation given by Mei Li from University Health Network. The presentation title is Disparities in Healthcare Outcome Measures Following Elective Surgery for Osteoarthritis from 2004 to 2018 in Ontario, Canada. Go ahead, Mei Li. Thank you. And thank you everybody for uh, giving me the opportunity to present our work today. <clears throat> so I'm presenting on behalf of my colleagues from the Schroeder Arthritis Institute at the University of Network here in Toronto. And just to give you a little bit of background, osteoarthritis is a common chronic condition that is associated with increased pain, disability, and, and high healthcare resource use. It's estimated that about between 20 to 30% of adults have osteoarthritis in at least one joint, mainly the knees and the hips. And projections indicate that in the next decade, uh, the, the burden of OA is expected to increase with a concomitant increase in total healthcare direct costs, mainly driven by hospitalizations and elective uh, surgery. On the other hand, uh, one area of interest uh, uh, by healthcare providers and, and policymakers is a, a the evaluation of the quality of surgical care. And for that, there are many indicators that are used, but the most common ones are looking at length of the hospital state, uh, stay, um, post-operative complications, and on-plan hospital readmissions and emergency department visits. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the burden of osteoarthritis uh, is not equally distributed among 
across the sociodemographic and social status dimensions, for example, social income or uh, the geographic location, whether it's rural or urban. Uh, and also there is some evidence of disparities in healthcare outcome measures, such as the, the ones that I mentioned before, uh, across these social uh, status dimensions, in particular in areas uh, where uh, access to care is not equal. So mainly there is no universal access to care. However, in jurisdictions with universal access to care, the, the findings are mixed. Some studies from some European countries uh, show no major uh, income or, or SES difference in general, while some studies in Canada show some uh, income despite this. So with this in mind, and in the, in the Canadian context of uh, universal access to care, we wanted to look at um, healthcare outcomes following surgery for osteoarthritis and compare them across social status dimensions, and also to look at time trends in these disparities uh, and see whether they have changed or not over time. So to do that, we conducted a retrospective population-based cohort study in Ontario, Canada, from 2000, uh, in which we look at patients that underwent elective surgery for OA from 2004 to 2018. And, and we capture uh, healthcare uh, use data that is uh, routinely collected. So mainly we use three big databases, the discharge abstract database that collects information of in, inpatient hospitalizations and surgeries, uh, the national ambulatory care reporting system that collects information on outpatient surgeries and emergency department visits, and the person registered database, which is the the, the database that co contains the sociodemographic characteristics of all the patients and uh, of all the population of Ontario. Our two main uh, variables looking uh, to measure social status uh, were neighborhood income quintiles and the residential location, that is whether patients live in rural or urban areas. And we focus on four uh, healthcare outcome measures, as I mentioned before, extended length of stay, adverse events or complications that occur during the hospital admission or within 30 days of discharge, and 30-day on-plan emergency visit, department visits, and 30-day uh, hospital readmissions. In addition to that, we have a set of various, uh, like the surgical joint, age, patient's age, sex, the surgery type, comorbidities, healthcare use in the year prior to surgery. This is an indicator uh, used to represent pa patient complexity. And then we have hospital type uh, and surgery volume as well. So for analysis, we just conducted a, uh, we just uh, fit uh, Poisson regression models where, where patients were clustered within hospitals uh, to compare uh, the outcome measures by the social status indicators and the year of surgery, and we control for the variables that I already uh, defined. We also look at interaction between the social social status indicators and year of surgery, just to test whether uh, these uh, changes uh, have changed or not over time. And we also examine an interaction between income and rural urban residents, just to to test for evidence of some intersectionality between these dimensions. So just to give you a little bit of background, um, over time, just this is the number of patients with a surgery for OA from 2004 to 2019. And we see that the number of surgery increased over time, which is not surprising because this measures the aging of the population. And generally, a, a surgery for OA, OA is more common among women than men, which is not surprising as OA generally speaking, is a disease that is more common among women than men. And the majority of these patients were 65 years or older, which again, OA is a, is a disease that is more common uh, in the older population. Not surprisingly, the majority of the surgeries were, were on the knee and the hip, which are the most common joints. When we lo look at the number of patients with surgery over time, um, by the income neighborhood, neighborhood income quintiles, we see that there is a slightly higher proportion of patients with OA 
uh, among the top income, which is the the third group line, uh, compared to the uh, bottom line ten. If all things were equal, we should be we should have equal like uh, proportions in each of these groups. The other thing interesting to note here is that from all studies, OA SDC studies more common among low SES and rural populations. So this is this this graph here is telling us that despite OA being being more common among low income individuals, we see that those getting surgery are more likely to live in, in the high income individual. And the other interesting uh, result is that we see that the, the, this, the proportion is, is pretty stable over time. When we look at the proportion of patients living in rural areas, having surgery for OA, overall uh, it was approximately 16%, which is uh, about the, the percent of the rural population in Ontario. So it looks like, uh, in terms of uh, rural urban uh, differences, these are not that big. And again, the proportion seems to be relatively stable over time. So in this figure here uh, is showing the four uh, healthcare outcomes over time and by income quintiles. Again, the, the mustard color is the low, the bottom income quintile and the blue is the top. Generally speaking, we see that those living in, in the lowest income quintile tends to have generally worse outcomes. So this is higher proportion staying longer in the hospital after surgery, higher proportions of uh, having complications and a higher proportions uh, having hospital readmissions and emergency department visits. And another interesting thing is that generally speaking, this difference were relatively stable over time. And once we adjusted for uh, the patient's social demographic, clinical characteristics, hospital and surgeon uh, characteristics, these differences didn't change. They remain the same. This figure here shows similarly the outcome distribution by comparing urban and rural residents. The, the most uh, bar here represents the rural residents and the blue represents the urban residents. With the exception of length of stay, generally speaking, people living in rural areas tend to have um, a worse outcomes, especially higher proportions have on-plan emergency department visits. This is likely uh, related to issues of access to, to primary care in Ontario. It's well documented that in some rural uh, areas with low accessibility to primary care, people in those areas use the emergency department just to, to satisfy the, the normal uh, healthcare needs that otherwise would be taken care of by a, a general practitioner. However, the finding in that rural residents tend to leave the hospital uh, earlier than urban residents is not completely um, explained uh, because when even we uh, account for like clinical characteristics and social demographic and that hospital tie and social volume, these differences still were reduced, but still remain significant. So this is the finding that is not completely uh, like understood. So just to summarize the finding, we found that looking at this data from uh, 2004 to 2018, generally speaking, pa patients undergoing, undergoing elective surgery for OA were more likely to live in, in, in neighborhoods uh, with higher income, that those living in low income neighborhoods or rural areas, generally speaking, have a generally worse outcomes, and that these differences persisted uh, between 2004 and 2018, even after we accounted for patient social demographic and clinical characteristics. In general, income disparities were a little bit greater than rural urban difference, with the exception of a 30 day emergency department visits. And also we found that the interaction between income and residential location was not significant in all models, uh, suggesting that we have no evidence to support that these two uh, indicators are interacting with each other. But before concluding, I just want to mention some of the limitations of this uh, routinely collected data. First, about, uh, around 90% of Ontario physicians are paid 
on a fee for safety basis, or they uh, uh, submit shadow billings uh, for each pa patient encounter, which imply that data on care delivered by salary physicians or physicians that are on the, working on the other alternative payments were not included in these databases. So we're missing about 10% of, of the healthcare use data. This, the, the main uh, limitation I would say of this data is that they like detailed clinical information about the patient and the hospital encounter. For example, and this limited uh, our ability to control for like disease severity, for example, something that is very important in osteoarthritis that's pain and function, but also may, um, may have contributed our inability to properly identify uh, complications that, uh, that occur during the hospital stay. But more importantly for this type of study, these databases don't collect information of the individual determin social determinants of health. So we have to rely on a measure of neighborhood income quintile based on postal code. It has been shown to be relatively good uh, by many uh, sensitivity studies, but still it's not the actual income of the patient. So it's kind of a crude measure. <laughs> but with these limitations in mind, uh, we found that even using these crude measures of uh, income, we found that even though universal coverage in Ontario has eliminated many obstacles to accessing care, there are still barriers remaining. Mainly that low-income residents with OA are less likely to get surgery despite they having the highest burden of the disease. And secondly, once even if they get the surgery, they are more likely to have worse outcomes than their uh, counterparts living in, in, in higher income uh, neighborhoods. We think given the lack of uh, detailed information that further attention to factors such as the patient's care seeking uh, behavior, treatment preferences, the availability of services and referral practices may uh, help to explain some of these disparities. And this is all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayuli. Any questions or comments? Questions and comments to this uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, I have a question to ask you, Mayuli. Mm -hmm. the, the, your study presents um, so many comprehensive data to show that uh, people in low income countries uh, have less uh, possibility, less likelihood to go to to get this surgery. I think this may be explained by this um, hesitance to get the surgery. But for the worst outcome, surgery outcome in low income or rural residents, a little bit for me, a little bit difficult to understand. What is the potential explanation for this uh, worst outcome, surgery outcome? Well, uh, I mean, I can only speculate because I don't have data. Yeah. Based on the literature, I think there are two issues here. Um, people with low income, so like elective surgery for osteoarthritis is a big surgery. So it's mainly joint replacement. So this is a big surgery that requires that people take relatively longer time of work. They also will recover faster if they have access to like physiotherapy after the surgery. Um, many people don't have support at home, like people you know, to help them and uh, cook meals, to buy groceries and stuff like that. So people in low income, I think what happened is people of low income, first they delayed the surgery because of these factors. So as long as they can function, even with pain and taking pills or whatever, they delay the surgery. But the problem is if you delay the surgery, then your case is more complex. And so perhaps your recovery is going to be uh, like slower and then perhaps that will contribute your complications, stay longer in the hospital because you have other complications and stuff like that. So, so I think that the problem is that earlier and then I start to compound because of uh, this fact. Unfortunately, the databases that we have are very cool, so we cannot really tease out these, uh, these issues. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments? Um, the, oh, yes, I think I, I found one question. Is there any data on inequalities related to rehabilitation or access to medications post-surgery? Yeah. 
Well, that's the issue. Like here in Canada, uh, rehabilitation services were delisted in 2005. So only now is there is inpatient rehab. So it's only people that are very, very bad that, that they get admitted to a rehabilitation hospital, get rehab. Most of the population having surgery for like a joint replacement after two or three days are sent back home. The surgeon will say, you know, it would be good if you can get a, a physiotherapy. Many people don't have, it's similar to the dental care issue, right? Like most people, if you get it through work, then you might be able to, to you know, to go and then your recovery period will be faster and less likely to get complications and stuff like that. But otherwise, people mainly in like retail jobs, construction work, which by the way, is where the disease is more prevalent, uh, won't have that kind of like benefits. So, it makes the, the, the recovery period uh, much worse. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any questions? And uh, actually I found a question to the previous speaker, Kiko. Can you please unmute and answer the questions? What do you think of the eye care coverage provided by the non-insured health health benefits program under the vision care benefit? Hi, I answered the question in the chat. So I don't know if you just want me to read my answer. Okay, uh, well, I basically just said that I think it's great that there are programs being provided for individuals who are not already covered. But if anything, I think that just highlights the fact that there, are, there is unequal coverage. It's a really good first step, but there's still a lot more that needs to be done to make sure that everyone can access eye care. Okay, thank you. Okay. Now we'll move on to the next presentation given by Gabriel from University of Montreal. The title of the presentation is a Social Inequality in Pediatric Burn in Quebec. Gabriel. Perfect, hi, just a moment, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so um, hi everyone, uh, just a second. So I'm gonna give a presentation about social inequality in pediatric burns in Quebec. So I just wanna thank, first of all, my supervisor, Emina. Um, one second, okay, so just a quick disclaimer, our study was funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, but there's no other competing interests. So we did this study because burns are one of the most common causes of pediatric injury. There are many causes of burns. The most common ones are uh, contact burns and hot liquid burns. And also, there's also house, house fires and electric burns that are common. Um, and around 10 to 20% of pediatric burns are intentional, so are caused actually by maltreatment. And there's few studies about pediatric burns in Canada, so we thought it would be relevant to study this population. And uh, because burns are so common and can cause many long-term consequences, um, it's important to prevent them. So some long-term consequences can include disfigurement, chronic pain, and scarring, which can, which can become pathological and can even limit functionality. So it is really important to work on the prevention of burns. And to be able to advance into the, in the prevention, it's important to look at possible risk factors so that we can address these. So what we wondered is if there might be a relationship between burns and socioeconomic status. So this is our objective. So what we wanted to do was prepare a portrait of soci socioeconomic inequality in pediatric burn admissions and deaths in Quebec. So we studied, uh, the, pop the population we studied was that of patients who were aged under 18 years, who were admitted for burn injuries between 1989 and 2021 in Quebec. We gathered data from hospital discharge abstracts um, using Medico. The exposure in our study was socioeconomic disadvantage, which we divided by quintile. So low, low, moderate, 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 high, and high neighborhood material deprivation. We measured socioeconomic disadvantage using Pampelon's deprivation index, which is a composite score of Canadian census data on neighborhood level income, education, and unemployment. So Pampelon's deprivation index actually measures two components. 
social and material deprivation. We focused on material deprivation only, which mainly reflects low income and education and a low employment to population ratio. And we were able to link the measures of material deprivation to Medico using the postal code of, resi of residents. And then the outcome for this study was admission for burn injury, which included also death. And we were actually able to separate the burn outcome into se se several categories. So first we separated them by anatomic location. So um, burns to the head and neck, to the trunk, to the shoulder and upper limb, to the wrist and hand, to the hip and lower limb, and in two multiple regions. Uh, we also separated burns based on the degree. So first, second, and third, which refers to the depth of the burn and the amount of, amount of tissue lost. And we also looked at the body surface involved, which is an important indicator of the prognosis of the burn injury. So we separated into less than 10%, 10 to 19, 20 to 29, and over 30%. So just to elaborate on the percent of body surface involved, this here is the Lund-Browder chart, which indicates the percentage that each body part equals to. So for example, if a child burns the entire back, that would be equal to 13% of the body surface. And you see on the head and legs that there are letters because the percent of body surface is different um, but depending on the age, which is what you see at the bottom of the diagram. So this chart helps to orient the patient to the burn unit if necessary. So the burn unit is an intensive care unit that, um, that, that we send children to if they're at risk of death uh, as a consequence of their burn. So if they have burns, um, over 5% of their body has 30, third degree burns, they're at risk of death and they need to go to the burn unit. Or if they have partial thickness burns of over 20% of their area, they also need to go to the burn unit. So I'll present now the results of our study. So this, in this table of the characteristics of burn admissions, we see at the top that there are more burns in children under 10 than in those over 10. And in the red box here, we see that uh, that um, many, we, we can see actually how many burn admissions come from which quintile of material deprivation. So here we can, we can clearly see that the amount of burn admissions gets higher as material deprivation increases. So for example, 11.7% of burns come from the least deprived quintile, whereas 27.9% of burns come from the most deprived quintile. And we can also see at the bottom of the table that the uh, uh, amount of burn admissions decreased over time, especially compared to the 1990s. So here I'm showing you a pie chart that's just, uh, it's an illustration of the, of the results from the previous table. So here you see that 12% um, or 11.7 precisely of, uh, of the burn admissions comes from the least deprived quintile, so in orange, and the most deprived quintile uh, has 30% of burn admissions. We also looked at the distribution of burn admissions over time. So here we see that the difference between the amount of admissions from the advantaged quintiles and the disadvantaged quintiles was relatively consistent over time. So around 30% of admissions comes from the two most advantaged quintiles, and which is on the left here, and around 50% of the burn admissions come from the two most disadvantaged quintiles. So we see that there are more burn, burn admissions from the more disadvantaged uh, quintiles. We also looked at the distribution of deaths in burn patients according to material deprivation. So here in the first column, you see the amount of patients who died at their admissions. And we see that there are more deaths in the most deprived quintile. So 19 deaths in the most deprived quintile and less than five in the two least deprived ones. We also see in the second column that there's a higher percentage of deaths in the most, most deprived quintile. So 36.5% of deaths compared to 5.8 in the least deprived quintiles. And this is for patients who arrived, uh, who were admitted and were, not, uh, were still alive at that, at that time. And then finally, in the third column, we see the death rate per 10,000 burn patients. And we see that it more than doubles when we compare the most deprived quintile to the least deprived. So 115 in the most deprived and 43 in the least. And I'll show one more table, which uh, shows the characteristics of the burn admissions that we talked about earlier. So the percent body surface, the degree of the burn and the site of burn. Um, we see on the right column that that uh, the, percent of, the percentage of burns that comes from the most deprived quintile is around 26 to 30% for most of the burn characteristics. And um, for, for patients who have, uh, who have over 30% of body surface burned, there's a little bit of a higher percentage that comes from the most deprived quintile, so 33.6, which we see in bold. 
And uh, if, if burns were if burns were equally distributed among the socioeconomic levels, we would expect 20% of burns to come from the least advantaged groups. So it shouldn't be uh, 30%. So what we can see from these results is that there is considerable socioeconomic inequality in burn morbidity and mortality among children and youth in Quebec. And uh, so it's clearly important to enhance burn prevention strategies. There are some ways to do this. Some ways to do this could be um, by focusing on fire safety education. So in Montreal, there's a smoke alarm, for example, in, in Montreal, there's a smoke alarm brigade that does awareness campaigns. They go door to door reminding people that smoke alarms are mandatory and they raise awareness um, regarding the three most frequent causes of house fires, which are cooking fires, smokers items and electrical fires. However, unfortunately, this brigade has been discontinued recently because um, it's actually students who do this uh, this door to door service and they haven't had enough students recently. However, the fire department did say that they will focus on inspecting at risk location. So following the results of this study, we might we think that neighborhoods with material deprivation would be important locations to focus on. Otherwise, education can also be done in schools. So the dog you see here is Chief the Fire Dog, who's included in fun activities for children to teach them about fire prevention in schools. Um, another important thing is that since around 10 to 20% of burns are caused by maltreatment, it might be important to provide parental support. It could be, it could be specifically, this could be specifically beneficial in cases of maltreatment. So just to, to conclude, uh, just before concluding, yeah, there is there are some limitations to our study. So first of all, we couldn't determine the intent or the method of the injury. So we don't know what kinds of burns were involved, what percentage were from fires, hot liquids, or contact burns, and we don't know if the burns were caused by maltreatment either. And uh, another limitation is that we didn't have a we well actually we used a, a neighborhood level measure of socioeconomic status, so we didn't have a, an individual level measure of income or education. So um, that's about it. Thank you. I left my email here in case uh, anyone has extra questions and we don't have time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabriel. And uh, there is a question for you in the chat box. Mm -hmm. How did you determine the postal code of residence? Yeah, so um, we basically we have with the um, with the, the information that we have on all the patients who are we Basically, the information we have comes from um, comes comes from a, a document uh, comes from hospital discharge abstracts, and these contain uh, the addresses of the patients. So we can we we have their postal codes with uh, with the hospital discharge abstract, abstracts. Sorry. Okay. Any questions? And I have oh yeah. Uh, yeah, so one question, two more questions. Mm -hmm. uh, question one, how do we know if education and information campaigns are reaching through, are reaching the at high, highest risk? Is there a way to target the campaigns to a highest risk group? Uh, pardon, I didn't quite understand. How do, how do we know if education and information campaigns are uh, reaching those at the highest risk is yeah. a way to target the campaigns uh, to the highest risk groups. Yeah, so good question. So um, personally, I don't know actually that much about the 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 uh, campaigns. What I do know, like I think they what I from what I've saw, seen from my research is that they go door to door. They don't necessarily have um, particularly na particular neighborhoods that they go more to, but what they want to do now is um, target specific locations that are more at risk. However, they didn't give much information about how they would target these neighborhoods. But with the information from this study, we could, we might think that some good neighborhoods to visit would be those with material deprivation. Okay, next question. Are children equally distributed in the quintiles? Did you calculate the proportions per quintile? Mm -hmm. Good question as well. Um, I'm just going to go back here to my other table just to um, 
like okay so as though as in like are there as many children in each quintile that is a good question i don't have uh the data on that right now with me so i it's a it's a actually a very good point and uh i'll i should go back and look at that thank you mm -hmm. okay um, i have a question so mm -hmm. the social inequalities in pediatric plan in, in quebec is apparent i'm mm -hmm. just wonder is the uh, adult plan have similar social inequality or you don't know yeah it's a very good question unfortunately i don't have any data to answer that okay so, so it's big and we how really about, studied only children pardon how about the other province other provinces except mm -hmm. quebec the similar social disability uh, social inequalities in pediatric brain exists in other provinces on the good question yeah so we really only looked at quebec uh because that's what we had data for um but it would be very interesting to 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 look at other populations in canada okay thank you and uh, only one can comment the great presentations gabriel thank you yeah thank you very much okay thank you very much gabriel now we move on to the last about the not least the presentation given by Christy from Li Kashin Knowledge Institute, Unity House, Toronto. The presentation title is Interventions Addressing the Social Determinants of Unhealthy Dietary Habits, a Systematic Review. Christy, go ahead, please. Thank you. I think that they're waiting um, to be let in. Mm. Your slides, yeah. We, we haven't seen your slides yet. Yeah, I just approved them. Let's see. Okay. It should Perfect. be here in a second. Thank you. Good morning, every good afternoon, everyone, I guess. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Spina Kumiha, and joining me today will be uh, Christy Kostanian and Victoria Davis from Avistream Lab at the St. Michael's Hospital. Today, we will be presenting our project titled Interventions Addressing the Social Determinants of Unhealthy Dietary Habits. So we acknowledge and express gratitude to the land in which we conducted this research, which is the traditional territory of many nations and is now home to First Nations in We and Miti. We would like to extend special thanks to our study team members, advisory group, and our funders at the Public Health Agency of Canada. We would also like to declare that there are no conflicts of interest. So here's a quick overview of today's outline that will include a brief introduction, our objectives, methods, results, discussion, followed by the conclusion, and then we will open the floor for Q&A. Unhealthy eating and subsequent obesity are major risk factors for chronic diseases. As of 2021, it was found that 22.2% of Canadians between the ages of 18 and 34 and around 33.4% of adults aged 50 to 64 self-reported as obese. A similar trend was observed in medicine minors where one in every three children was overweight or living with obesity. Lack of access to affordable healthy food, living in food desserts, and health illiteracy are some social determinants of health with chronic diseases that also exist great health inequalities and racial disparities. Unhealthy eating is linked with social and structural factors, which can be observed in the case of underprivileged populations where obesity was found to be inversely proportional to income and education levels. Thus, there is a need to understand the social, how social determinants of health interventions tackle unhealthy eating behavior in order to mitigate the risk of chronic disease and promote health equity. 
So to do that, we worked on a couple of research questions. The first of, uh, the first of which was do interventions that address the social determinants of health have the potential to improve unhealthy dietary habits? And the second question was what intervention specific characteristics influence healthy eating outcomes? So for example, the intensity of the intervention um, is slim as well as the components of interventions. Now onto the methodology, and we'll start with the search strategy and terms. We enlisted the help of an information specialist to search eight peer reviewed databases using the following key terms and healthy eating or diet plus underserved populations, as well as other um, SDOH terms and the word interventions. So the peer reviewed databases that we searched included Midline, Cochrane, Inveys, Psych Info, as well as others. And we also um, searched six great literature sources, including Oven Gray and NCD Alliance websites, as well as conducted Google searches. Now, um, the studies that did fit our eligibility criteria and were included underwent quality appraisal using the MMAT 2018 tool. We had predefined really strict eligibility criteria. Studies were included only if they were published between January of 1990 to August 2022, uh, were primary quantitative or mixed method studies um, directed at least to one uh, social determinant of health that influences unhealthy eating, um, reported the interventions impact on unhealthy eating behavior as well as the social determinant of health, and was conducted in a healthy population of adults or children, and was conducted in a high income country. And now to Victoria. Thanks so much, Mena. Great. So over 16,000 articles underwent full first level screening and 1,234 full text articles were assessed. Ultimately, 77 articles were included in our study. Most interventions aimed to improve, sorry, Mena, next slide. Okay. Thank you. Most interventions aim to improve access and availability to healthy food through monetary incentives or food coupons. There were varied effects of the intervention on fruit and vegetable intake. Multi-component interventions were often effective, such as combining healthy eating education sessions with food market tours and helping with enrollment in available government food programs. Many interventions were for less than one year, occurred in the USA, and were quasi-experimental. Very few were based in Canada. Overall, most articles met our criteria for having appropriate methodological quality on the mixed methods appraisal tool. We categorized the interventions based on three different levels. Only three articles described population level interventions. This include an article assessing minimum wage increases among low income worker populations in two United States cities, although no statistically significant difference was found in dietary intake between the in intervention and the comparator. Another study evaluated the Food Insecurity Nutrition Incentive Program across 15 states and found an increase in the average monthly expenditures on food and vegetables among the program recipients. Most, or 81% of articles described community or organization level interventions. These focused on changing the availability of healthy food environments near lower income neighborhoods, offering food coupons and other incentives to community farmers markets, and all had varying levels of success on fruit and vegetable consumption. Approximately 16% of articles described individual or family level interventions, including a study that evaluated the effects of a school garden intervention on the availability of fruits and vegetables in children's homes. The study found a significant difference in the availability of low fat vegetables in these homes. Social terms of health interventions have some potential to improve short term healthy eating behavior among underserved populations. However, the outcomes were focused on healthy food purchasing and fruit and vegetable intake, and there was less reporting on changes in the social determinants of health themselves. This may be because changes in social determinants of health are much more difficult to measure. Studies also lacked assessment of longer term outcomes, which makes it difficult to evaluate the impact of interventions overall and, the, and their sustainability. 
There was also a relatively narrow focus on financial incentives and food environment changes, as opposed to other social determinants of health domains, such as housing, employment, or higher educational attain attainment. Significant knowledge gaps remain from this review, including the effect of social determinants of health interventions for longer term healthy eating behavior, the impact of interventions on changing individuals' social determinants of health outcomes, and population level interventions that target a broader set of social determinants of health. I will pass it on to Christy. Thanks, Victoria. To conclude, our review found that utilizing interventions that target the social determinants of health could be an effective and sustainable way for changing unhealthy eating behaviors. However, more randomized clinical trials that implement interventions targeting both unhealthy eating behavior and their social determinants of health are needed. Therefore, future directions for research can include interventions that tackle the macro level, uh, for example, at the population uh, level and government level, and that examine social determinants of health and interventions that tackle uh, unhealthy eating behavior in other settings, especially in low and middle income countries. Thank you for listening. And now we open the floor for any questions. Thank you for the excellent team presentation. Uh, questions and comments. Any questions or comments? You can unmute yourself and state your question or type your questions in the chat box. Oh, it seems a very clear presentation. No questions and comments. No, I didn't find any questions and comments in the chat box. Okay, so if not, the presentation for this afternoon are concluded. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the speakers, both the keynote speakers and the rapid fire speakers for your great presentations at the symposium and for sharing your interesting research results. There is an evaluation form consisting of seven questions the link for the evaluation form was posted in the chat box and will also be sent to you via email. Please kindly fill out this short form to help us do better next year. Next, I would like to thank America's Network for Chronic Disease Surveillance, AMNET, for the generous IT support and collaboration in providing the Zoom platform for this year's symposium. Noah from the executive board of AMNET and the CAFS symposium committee will briefly introduce AMNET to us. Noah, please. Good, thank you very much. Um, first of all, congratulations to all speakers for a really uh, great symposium today. We've heard a lot of great presentations and for us, for AMNET, it was a great pleasure to be part of it and, and of, of the journey of today's session. So just to be very brief, uh, I'd like you to tell you a little bit more about our organization because we have the same founding members. I'm Bernard Choi. He was the founding member of both organizations. And with, with, with your association does, we do similar things, but on the entire Americas. And so Omnid is the Americas Network for Chronic Disease Surveillance. And we are about 20 years old. It was founded in 2003 Montevideo in, uh, in Uruguay. And we're gonna have this year our 20th anniversary. Omnid is um, in process now be um, registered in, in Medellin in Colombia. So we're in the last steps. So we've been registered in several places until we find like a new home for our organization. And so we're gonna be registered as an NGO in, in Colombia. The vision and mission of Omnet that the most importantly, we, our vision is to reduce non-communicable diseases in the region and improve the surveillance and monitoring process for non-communicable diseases and the risk factors 
in the Americas and the Caribbean. So it's not just South America, Central America. North America is an important part of it and the Caribbean as well. So our mission is to create a network among health professionals for offering professional training and epidemiological surveillance, prevention and control of non communicable diseases, the lifestyle habits and risk factors. And I'd like to emphasize that as CARFs, that we are a network of health professionals, so we're not a network of ministries, organizations, even though we accept like institutional memberships, but it's really creating a network among all healthcare professionals in the Americas in our two continents. Omnid is organized. Uh, we have our board consists of 13 people. We have the executive board consists of the president, the president-elect and the past president. They each serve like two-year terms. Then the secretary and the treasurer. Then we have eight uh, different committees that work on everything we do. We have a scientific committee, take care of our um, abstract submissions for annual meeting. We have a financial committee, a communication committee. And here I'd like to thank a lot to, to Sile and to Paula for today as they took care of most of the communication. Sile, she's the leader of the communication committee. And, and thanks to her, we had all the nice background pictures and the IT support. We have a membership committee, a nomination committee for some of the awards. Again, I mentioned you. Then we have a professional development committee that organize webinars as you do, and then some uh, international relation committee and our annual conference committee. We have an official journal that's called the American Journal of Non-Communicable Diseases. It's a new journal. It's about six, seven months old. So we, we're working on our inaugural issue. We have at the moment one published article um, from a couple of months ago, and we invite you to submit uh, your manuscripts to our journal. It's public, it's an online journal, but it's free of charge. So there's no costs involved and you can publish in English, um, Portuguese and Spanish. And we may consider actually the French option as well as it's an important language in the Americas as well. We have annual meetings and this is our highlight the biggest event of the year. And last year meeting was in Medellin in Colombia, so 19th meeting. And there is actually, we have uh, the highest reward we can get for leadership in Omni is the Bernard Choi Award. And this is like our first recipient of the Bernard Choi Award, um, Dr. Paula Diaz, who is also here with us. And it's the first time we had that, that award also to uh, recognize the excellent word and to say thank you to Bernard for um, setting up and our organization. This year's meeting in September is going to be in Brazil, in Porto Alegre, in the south of Brazil, between 13th and 15th September. You're cordially invited to join. There's no registration fee, and the meeting is in person, but there's probably going to be some virtual component. And submission for apps are going to start early July. And so if you'd like to present posters, abstracts, or oral presentations, you're more than welcome to submit uh, information to our to our meeting. Finally, we are open for membership. Uh, several of CARFs are a member of, of Omnet. Membership is free. The only thing you need to do is um, go in on our web page. I'm going to show you in a minute the link to web page. There's a form, a Google form. You sign up as member. The membership committee is going to revise your application, and then they're going to proposed to the Board of Amnet to, to be approved, then you receive a certificate and information email if your membership has been accepted. If you'd like to learn, we do a lot of webinars throughout the years. We have on our webpage on www.redamnet.org, you find past recordings of our webinars, everything free of charge, and you find more information what we do and as well information on our actual board and mem members. So we have 250 officially registered members, but our newsletters reach about three or 4,000 people in all the Americas at the moment. We have an Instagram account, a Twitter account, and also a Facebook account that we use to disseminate information on our association. So you're more than happy to join us and we welcome you to join our organization as we do not have many people from Canada and we're really great having more people because uh, you're an important part of the Americas and you have a lot of experience and I'm sure there's a lot of things we can share, you can share with us and be with you. So welcome to Omnet.
And thank you again for everybody to be part of this exciting symposium. Thank you, Noah. And uh, I noticed a short question in the chat box. Uh, they ask, uh, will the slide decks be emailed to us? If so, when? I think, uh, to my understanding, CUPS, we do not collect uh, the presentation slides. So it's up to the presenter to determine if they are willing or if they feel comfortable to disseminate the slides to you. If the presenter feel comfortable, please send your slides to the CUPS contact email and we may circulate to the participants. That is the question I have. Okay, now I would like to invite the CAPS advisory members, Dr. Bernard Cho and Dr. Jona Rosalie to give the closing remarks. Dr. Cho is the founder of CAPS. Dr. Rosalie is the winner of the name context for the network now called CAPS. Both Dr. Cho and Dr. Rosalie retired. Dr. Cho retired from the Public Health Agency of Canada, and Dr. Rosalie retired from BC CDC. Although both are retired, they are both keeping very busy. For example, Dr. Cho will fly somewhere tomorrow to give a keynote speech, and Dr. Rosalie is serving as the chair of the Scientific Committee of an International Conference in Mauritius in July 2023. In other good news, Dr. Rosalie was selected for the Canadian Public Health Association Honorary Life Membership Award and the Fulbright Visiting Scholar in the USA. Congratulations, Dr. Rosalie. These retirees are still working hard and actively contributing to our community. We are so happy that Dr. Cho and Dr. Rosalie are available to join today's symposium. They will give closing remarks for our symposium today. Dr. Cho, please. Hello, everyone. Good to see you all here. It has been such a big success for the 2023 COP Symposium. And I would like to thank also MNET, the America's Network for Chronic Disease Surveillance um, for the technical support. And before I give my closing remarks about my own um, thoughts and experience with the TARPs in the last 15 years, I just want to thank a number, a number of people and uh, when I read their names, I would like them to turn their video on and, 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 and say something, wave your hand. Um, this is the time to showcase the um, organizing committee of this year's CARF Symposium. I would like to introduce Kavita Singh. Hello, Kavita from Health Canada in Ottawa. You're on mute. Hello, Bernard. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. I think it's been such an informative day. I've, I've learned so much. Um, I'm, I'm just really and really proud of the team CARVS organizing committee for putting this day together. Thank you all. Um, Catherine Yapping, thank you for moderating. You've, you've done an excellent job. Um, so yeah, just just one wonderful day. A lot of memories to take away. Kavita is the chair of the organizing committee of this year's symposium. We all learned from you, Kavita. Thank you for your leadership and professionalism. And now we have Mayile Canisares. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Say a few words. Well, I just, unfortunately, I have to join the afternoon, but I really enjoy it very much. Uh, I think it was great. So I'm happy that we managed to do another year of the of the symposium. Hopefully we can make more to come. <laughs> Thank you, Maile. Maile is the co-chair of the organizing um, committee of the symposium. And of course, next we have uh, Yaping Jin. 
a professor from the University of Toronto. Hello, hello. Thank you very much. I learned a lot. I'm especially impressed by the dental care uh, presentation. Good work in the, as a moderator. We have Catherine McMillan from the U of Ottawa in Ottawa. Hi, everyone. I, I have to echo uh, the other organizers' comments. I learned so much today, and it was really exciting for me. Thank you all. We all learned from you, too. It's an interactive process. And of course, we have Celine Tuan from the Institut National de, uh, de Santé Publique de Quebec, from, from Quebec City. <laughs> Bienvenue. Bonjour tout le monde. Merci, merci à tout le monde. Thanks to all the presenters. It was a really interesting day and seeing what's done all across Canada is very inspiring for the future and all the things we, we could we can do better in surveillance. So thank you everyone. And we have May Tang Ku. Uh, I don't know, I don't think she is with us at this moment. Uh, but May is from um the Institute de la Statistique du Québec uh, in Montreal. Next, we have, oh, that, that's the whole organizing committee, right? No, no one, no one is the organizing committee. Oh yeah, yes. No one make a huge contribution <laughs> to help us resolve this uh, Zoom platform issues. <laughs> And also NOAA is a bridge between the Canadian civilians and the American civilians to link together. So what do you think, Joel? No, thank you. I, I'm a member of CARF since a year now. So it's been a pleasure to collaborate. And even I'm not really located in Canada, but I, I, I love Canada. So I, I feel like Canadians. <laughs> it's OK. A lot of us here are members of MNET. Noel Barango is a professor um, in Miami, uh, United States. But I really want to show uh, Paula. Is Paula here? I'm not sure. I think she's not no Let's longer. Just step out. Oh, no, she is. She oh, is. I'm right. here. Professor Paula <laughs> Piaz is from Medellin, Colombia. We are so Thank you, Professor. You. Also from MNET. It's a great day. I, it was a, an amazing um, opportunity to, to listen everyone, to share thoughts about surveillance. Thank you very much. And thank you, Carl. And thank you all of you for this amazing um, organization, this very important and interesting journey. Thank you, Dr. Bernard Choi for these great things. It's always um, a good, a nice opportunity to say hello to you and everyone, to to, to feel this um, nice feeling for the public health. Thank you. And we have two advisory members, Dr. Drona Rasali, former director at the DC CDC in Vancouver. Hi, Drona. Hello, Bernard. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Do you want me to say a few words? No, no, no. You do not need to say a few words because you have your closing remarks after me. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. For... Are you after me because then you will have all the time for you to finish your closing remarks. Okay, thank you. Now, um, I I'm going to sh share my screen with you. Um, And then I'm going to ask everyone a question and see who can answer it. I hope you can all see the screen here. Yes, so we can see. Uh, yeah, what me is too. Mm -hmm. um, this is the Canadian Alliance for Regional Risk Factor Surveillance. It is a Canadian alliance. It is for risk factor surveillance. 
And, and this is a name that we created uh, 15 years ago. It may not reflect the present day knowledge on surveillance. I I'll tell you why. And this is uh, at the regional level. So when COFS was created, we were talking about the local health unit level, uh, which did not get as much support as they need um, from other people. So um, I was a senior research uh, scientist with the Public Health Agency of Canada. Uh, I retired uh, half a year ago and I'm now affiliated with the Division of Clinical Public Health, the Dalana School of Public Health, uh, University of Toronto. And that's me. Uh, if you compare the, uh, the slide deck and my real picture, you can see this is a surveillance over time. That the picture was taken about five years ago, uh, but on from the internet, I couldn't find another picture of myself. So I, I used this. I was the chair of the 2008 Think Tank Forum in Toronto, attended by 108 public health surveillance professionals uh, across Canada, and we decided to create CARVs. I was also the chair of one year later, the 2009 CARVs first symposium. And now we have the 2023 symposium. Today we had a, a great Day, we had um, keynote speakers from the Public Health Agents of Canada, from the World Health Organization, and from the University of Western Ontario. And we had a lot of very high quality, uh, rapid fire, uh, abstract presentations. In the past symposiums of CARVs, we had uh, speakers from um, uh, Paho from the US CDC, but today is the first time we had a uh, speaker from the WHO. CARVs was created in 2008 out of the recognition that networking is a formula for success for public health surveillance. It is very important, especially for the local health units, regional health units, um, for example, in Ontario, I think we had, I, I forgot the number, 20, 30 local health units. Um, back in 2008, a lot of these health units were working in isolation. And for example, if they want a textbook in epidemiology, they couldn't find other uh, people to help them. So, and, and also technical expertise. So COFs was created um, in 2008, the Think Tank Forum, which decided that a new network in surveillance should be established. There was a naming contest that gave the new network the name, the Canadian Alliance for Regional Risk Factor Surveillance or CARVs. And the name of our network was given by Dr. Rasali. At one point, CARVs had 500 members, seven working groups engaging 60 active members in various projects, manage a budget that pay for 100 to 150 participants to excuse attend. Me, excuse me, Dr. Cho, your slides didn't move. Did you move your slides? You need to use this uh, slideshow mode. It's always the first slide. You are screen sharing. Stop share. No, you should use this slide sh slide show or something. You, because uh, none of the slides are moved. It's just uh, always your, your only one first slide. Um, can anyone tell me how to advance my sharing? You you just go uh, pay, 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 next page next page next. Oh. Yeah, now you share and uh, you can go next page. You can go to the uh, presentation mode as well, but uh, even without that, you can advance the page by going into next page. Should I use share screen? 
Yeah, of course. Well, okay, I hit share screen again, and I find my presentation and share. Yeah, yeah, you should click. Yes, please. Can you see history of carbs? Yeah. But they didn't move. They didn't. Oh, move. I'm seeing only the first, first, uh, first slide with your picture. Can you see it shifting? No, nothing is happening. Yeah, so, so how about you? Uh, you push it to next uh, slides. You move hey. on to next slides. Next is button, it last uh, slide or one? First, you click on the uh, uh, on the page. First, you need to click on the page, then go to next page. Next, next. Can you click on the body of the material? Hmm. Nothing moves, huh? No, nothing moves. And, and there is a presentation bottom at the bottom the menu bar, small little one. If you click that, then it will go to presentation mode as well. Mm. Bernard, may I suggest you go a cappella? Because I, I thought it was very interesting, even if we didn't have any visual. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I I didn't even notice it was not like changing the uh, yeah yeah slide so oh, you can go a cappella yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 that's good just forget Actually, about I this thought, slide yeah. I also see, uh, thought the same you are just uh, narrating the story but uh, in your own words and uh, you are not using the slide that's what I thought there is no problem with that okay okay uh, I have no problem with that too. So at one point, COPS had 500 members. We had seven working groups engaging about 60 active members in various projects. In a way, like the uh, operations of MNET at this time, we manage a budget that could pay for about 100 to 150 participants to attend two national meetings in Toronto. And uh, COPS at the beginning when we were established uh, a lot of international conferences uh, invited us to uh, give lectures and presentations about the experience uh, of CARBS uh, in Antigua, Argentina, China, Colombia, and the USA. And we even had a um, quarterly e-newsletter called CARBS e-news. And all members had access to an email-based communication platform for instant questions, discussion, and information exchange across Canada. So what we learn here is that CARF is a network. We can do whatever we want to do. As long as there are ideas, uh, right ideas, and with a little budget, we can proceed and do our work. Over the years, we see an evolution of CARFs, shifting of our focus in four directions. The first one is that we shifted from surveillance capacity building, which is basically setting up training courses, teaching people how to use logistic regression, uh, geographic information system training, to surveillance innovation, to research, to um, progress in, um, in uh, our knowledge. And secondly, we moved from the local health unit level, the regional level, to also include federal, provincial, and territorial levels. And that's why we have got such a big family now here today um, for people not just working in the regional level. Number three, we have expanded from risk factor level to health determinants, um, which is much bigger. When we were created, I mean, calves, we were focusing on, on uh, smoking, alcohol, food, and exercise. But now we have expanded to health 
inequity, um, social economic factors, and environmental factors like climate change. And lastly, we moved from a single source funding model, which is which was basically uh, full funding from the Public Health Agency of Canada to multiple source funding model. And that's the way to do it uh, in the present day situation. Um, I want to talk about change and challenge. In this world, nothing is constant. Change is the only constant. When there's change, there is challenge. When there's challenge, we need to change. And in fact, if you look at the word challenge, you see the word change embedded inside it. Challenges for calves. For calves to continue its success and make a long and healthy health adjusted life expectancy, health. Don't forget to tackle the following challenges. This is the 15 years um, for calves. So we are a 15 year old teenager. We want to live a long life. This is the 20th year for MNET. MNET has passed its teenager stage and is now an adult, but still MNET would like to live a long health adjusted life expectancy. And there are four secrets to do that. Number one, acquire new blood. We need to get more people interested and in contributing to the goal. So for both CARBs and MNET, that's important. If you, we do not have new blood, when the old generation of founding members um, leave, the, the network can no longer make progress. And number two, acquire new funding. Any meaningful work would need a handsome budget. If we do not have a good budget, a lot of things cannot be done. Number three, listen to the stakeholders, find out their wants. What do they want to do, want to contribute? And number four, we need to actually do something. It is not a laughing matter. We need to actually do something. If COPS or MNET is not doing something, then there's no, it is not meaningful and, that, and, and it is difficult to, to exist. And of course, of course, this is a catch-22 situation. And, and, and this is actually a catch-22 situation. To actually do some work, we need a sponsor to provide funding. But without showing our work, we won't get a sponsor. So for any new organizations and young networks, the way is to get an increasing number of volunteers at first to donate their time and produce something actually useful, like calves. Um, all the organizing committee members are donating their free time um, to the work. And to start up, when we can get some seed funding, we can grow and spiral up. We also need to actually work on something because in physics, work is defined as force times distance. W equals F times B. If we put our hand on the table, no matter how hard we push down, if the table does not move down, there's no work done. So energy or force spent does not equals work. And this is a question about working hard and also working smart. This is for both CARBs and MNET for the future. Now, um, this is something I don't have in my slide deck because this is something that's coming out from um, today's, um, today's uh, symposium. My question for everyone is, 
who can give me the definition of surveillance? Anyone? Just speak out, raise your hand, or, or just unmute yourself. Surveillance is the ongoing. Anyone, Celine? You put me on the spot. It's no, the... because I, I see your name on my. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I, it's the ongoing um, systematic follow up of indicators that we have to um, diffuse. So give the decision makers to make a better uh, decision for the population. Bravo, well done, <laughs> 100, <laughs> 100 marks. Yeah, surveillance is the ongoing systematic collection, analysis and interpretation of data with the timely dissemination of information to those who need to know, period. And in recent year, uh, we have also added who need to know and to act, period. Do you see any problem with this definition? Is there a need for moving forward with a new definition? And is that something that CARVs or an MNET can work on? Anyone? I see the name Noel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please. I'm sorry, Dr. Choi. I just want to say how we act is important yeah. and yes 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 Ooh. right Ooh. on right on if you if you look at the the uh, history of surveillance is in, in in the last say 50 years you can see that we are all the surveillance professionals have been working on things from the beginning of the definition towards the end of this of the definition but we haven't quite finished that work yet. At the beginning, the surveillance professionals were very, um, very uh, paying a lot of attention to uh, data collection. The ongoing and systematic collection of data to work on biases, to make sure that all the data that we have got are unbiased and clean and comparable. So that's a very, first stage. And then we moved on to working on the data analysis. We developed complex analytical tools, including um, uh, logistic regression, hypergeometric distribution, and, and things like that. And then we move on towards the end. And now, like today, we have seen a lot of great databases so big that it includes everything. You can search by uh, selecting parameters and, and then compare. And it is, we are now at the database and information stage. Data after analysis becomes information. Information after interpretation becomes intelligence. We are not quite at the intelligence stage yet. The question is how do we move forward from data to information, to an uh, intelligence, and finally to wisdom. That's the very fine, uh, final step of the whole surveillance process. So at this time, surveillance is still is is very good at the beginning step, but we are very weak at the end. How do we show to the policy and action uh, people? what to act, how to act. Right now, surveillance ends at the information dissemination stage, but that's not good enough. A lot of the policy people, action people, they simply do not understand the high level, what's the beta coefficient of a regression. They don't understand that. If you present them with a big thick report, 200 pages, they will look at chapter one, chapter two, with all these bar charts and line graphs, 
and they start to make decisions to produce policies and they will not be able to understand the, the chapter 15, chapter 16 on a lot of complex um, statistics. So what should we do? Maybe this is just a, a, a simple thought. I think in the future meetings, conferences or COPS and MNET, we should explore how do we make sure that the information products from surveillance can be in a well-packaged, um, nicely comprehensible product to be um, actively sent to those people who are acting, who are making policies and decisions. For example, should we not produce a Canada 2023 top 10 news um, in health? So this is a, a lot of work. This is a, a distillation of all the databases that we have in Canada in various aspects. And then we chose the top 10 and the policymakers would be in a better position to, to know what's important and what to do and, 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 and so on. That's the end of my um, uh, closing remark. Thank you very much. Drona, we cannot hear you. I think you're yeah. next. Can, can you take, take, take yeah. off the- Yeah, it uh, works sharing, now. Stop, stop sharing, please. Because I'm not seeing everyone here. I have got different sort of thing here. Yeah, any, anyway, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, good afternoon, good afternoon everyone. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful uh, symposium, day-long symposium. It has been really, uh, you know, overwhelming in the sense of uh, knowledge, uh, knowledge and uh, uh, depth of, uh, depth and uh, uh, breadth of the knowledge we have we have shared today, uh, especially uh, on the theme of addressing the uh, social determinants of health equities through public health surveillance. This was very rightly a chosen uh, chosen topic area to uh, this uh, th this year, and uh, especially. There are a lot of specialties of today, this, uh, this year's symposium. Oh, first of all, the organizing committee. This is entirely a second generation um, organizing committee. Uh, and we have completed, as Bernard mentioned, uh, 15 years, long 15 years of uh, first phase, I would say. We had had many phases in the past. Now we can say uh, 15 years is the uh, first phase. Now we are going into the second phase uh, where uh, old guards have been uh, retired, most of them, and the new guards have uh, taken over. And uh, it has come in a big way. And especially this year, not only the topic area, the thematic title wa was great and uh, very much timely and the need of the time, but also the whole spectrum of presentations actually expanded the horizon of the um, symposium. Typically in the past, we were focusing mainly on uh, population and public health. This year, I see that we have had many presentations uh, that are in included clinical epidemiology, fantastic keynote uh, address on dentistry in, in addition to other uh, you know health equity related keynote speaker uh, uh, the speech was so comprehensive enough and also epidemiology of surgery we have not dealt much on surgical surgical cases uh, which were not in our radar so what i can say is this year we have had really an expanded form of uh, cash that shows the new way of doing things. 
uh, doing things differently for better. Uh, that's what has happened. And uh, at the end, we always have this uh, wonderful, thoughtful, thought-provoking um, you know, ideas and uh, summary uh, by Dr. Bernard Choi. That, that, that has been our traditional uh, thing. At the end of the day-long symposium, we summarize with uh, Dr. Bernard's um, thoughtful ideas and thoughts and summary. Uh, we are I'm very much thankful to this organizing committee uh, led by Kavita, Miley, uh, Shilin, uh, Catherine, uh, Yaping, Noel. All of you have done really marvelous job. Thank you so much. And I would like to also thank each and every one of our uh, participants, fellow participants, colleagues who, have, uh, who, are, who came out in great number to join in this Zoom symposium. We're always maintained. In many symposiums, people drop out in the middle, but today was consistently quite high, high number maintained, uh, about 50 most of the time, which is a, a great achievement, I think. So we have done a great job. Uh, last not the least, I would like to thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Yaping Jin for introducing uh, myself uh, so nicely. You have been very generous in your introduction of myself. Uh, really, uh, I see the, uh, the wonderful success of this uh, uh, symposium today. And going forward, uh, the organizing committee should come up with some ideas how to move forward in the second phase. Uh, basically, uh, Bernard has already outlined the roadmap uh, of uh, four steps, uh, acquiring new blood, which we uh, need to do continually, acquiring new funding program, listen to the stakeholders, and doing something. And in the call of uh, Bernard, I would like to add that in the definition of surveillance, we need to really incorporate a thing uh, the direction of the surveillance. Well, in the usual surveillance definition, it doesn't have this, this, uh, the direction, where we want to go. It doesn't focus. It says just surveillance, do monitor, monitor the health. Uh, that doesn't give some a sense of direction. Now we need to do, do direction. And uh, uh, Bernard mentioned that in the past, we had been focusing on majorly uh, major risk factor, risks and protective factors. They, they are still good for non-communicable diseases, but over the years, a lot of things have happened. Knowledge uh, has been so much of tremendous. If we re start reading about the papers published in epidemiology about COVID, I don't think anyone can finish reading all the papers in their lifetime, from, starting from now. So much of papers have been uh, accumulated and published and uh, accumulated in the literature worldwide. So knowledge is so much enormous. Now we have to really give a direction to how we process the, the knowledge to inform the policy. That's what I think. Uh, having said that, uh, the direction I, I was meaning to us, that, you know, we started with the major uh, risk factors now is the time to focus on determinants of health, which are already established, but it's still not really taken into consideration in policy making, making all the time. That's what we need to do. When I was uh, looking at COVID uh, uh, risk factors and uh, other social determinants of health for COVID, what I suddenly realized that all these deter social deter what we call social determinants of health, and also the uh, risk factor and protective factors are actually the results of uh, are the consequences, not the root cause. Root cause is somewhere else. Root cause are really in the social and socio-cultural factors that have been handed to us for centuries. That's why I made a proposal to Fulbright, Fulbright Canada, that I study. Uh, we need to focus, really look back. Actually, we should uh, time travel. 
we should go back to back in time and see what happened in the uh, early ancient times, then medieval times, and contemporary times, 21st, uh, 20th and 21st century. What has happened? What has happened to us that we have this, this disparity, health disparities uh, across population? Why we are all not equal? And we have, we have so much of disparity that we cannot imagine. Canada has uh, some subpopulations which are doing worse than uh, the developing country, very poor country. That should not be the case. The root cause is somewhere else. It is because of the historical uh, wrongdoings of human mankind and society. For that reason, we should go there back in time and uh, look back and really try to correct. That should be the direction of future uh, surveillance. So that's why I didn't make any prepare, prepared notes or a presentation. That's why I'm uh, randomly speaking. But my uh, thinking is we need to have uh, in the surveillance definition, we, we should include some direction uh, of what we want to do in the future. Uh, of the society that we are looking for future. Uh, I don't want to take much time. Uh, thank you so much, each and everyone. We, uh, really, we have done a wonderful job, especially the organizing committee. Uh, kudos to you all the time, as always. And this year, you have done exceptionally well. I'm grateful to you on behalf of whole team and our community of CARS. Uh, hopefully, next year is... Uh, Professor uh, Yapin Jin mentioned, we are, she indicated, we are retired, but not tired. So mm -hmm. we will be there to support you whatever way we can, even for looking for some ideas for funding. If you uh, can gather some few more people in the organizing committee, we can write proposals. I think we should try something. Uh, and uh, also, and last but not the least, I'd like to thank Mnet uh, team who have been really uh, instrumental to make this uh, uh, symposium a grand success today, uh, uh, led by Noel. Thank you so much. Thanks all. And uh, I, uh, I, I can say that uh, the symposium has been successful and is concluded here and now. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and uh, hope to see you in um, in next year's CAPS symposium. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.